Section Zero of the Kia, a New Zealand problem. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. The Kia, a New Zealand problem by George Reginald Mariner. Section Zero, dedication, and author's note. Dedicated with permission of Mrs. Hutton to the late Captain F. W. Hutton, F.R.S., in humble appreciation of his eminent service in many departments of New Zealand zoology, in warm admiration of the proof he furnished in character and utterances that pure religion and true science may keep close company, and in deep gratitude for personal encouragement and help in the writer's early scientific study. It was a wondrous realm beguiled, our youth amid its charms to roam, or scenes more fair, serenely wild, not often summer's glory smiled, when flecks of cloud transparent bright, no alabaster hall so white, thing lightly in a luminous dome of sapphire, seemed to float and sleep, far in the front of its blue steep, and almost awful none the less, for its liquescent loveliness, behind them sunk, just o'er the hill the deep abyss, profound and still, the so immediate infinite, that yet emerged the same it seemed in hue divine, and melting balm, in many a lake whose crystal calm, uncrisped, unwrinkled, scarcely gleamed, where sky above and lake below would like one sphere of azure show, save for the circling belt alone, the softly painted purple zone of mountains, bathed where nearest seen, in sunny tints of sober green, with velvet darks of woods between, all glassy glooms and shifty sheen, while here and there some peak of snow would o'er their tenderer violet lean, and yet, within this region, fair with wealth of waving woods these glades and glens and luster-smitten shades. I, in this realm of seeming rest, what sights you meet and sounds of dread. Alfred Domit. Author's Note. To write a book about a bird may seem to some a needless task. That depends more on the bird than on the writer. The New Zealand mountain parrot we call the kia presents a topic of importance from many points of view. For half a century, he has been accused of being a sheep-killer. That accusation, persistently and vehemently made, has drawn the attention of the scientific and non-scientific alike. For a parrot of but average proportions to develop a furious carnivorous propensity is zoologically remarkable enough. When this alleged habit is held to be the cause of heavy losses to the sheep-farming industry of a country, it demands study also on other than zoological grounds. Naturally enough, much has been written already. For fifty years the Kia has been a veritable Ishmael, and has been treated on the principle. Give a bird a bad name and shoot him. Not all that has been told of him, however, is true. Much has been wild as conjecture. Part is but colorably accurate. All, until lately, was more or less uncertain. There seems to be room for a careful and detailed examination of the subject. Such an examination is here attempted. The writer cannot claim that he is quite alone in either the matter or the method of his investigation. After he had begun his work upon the sheep-killing problem, he found that Professor W. B. Benham, D.S.C., F.R.S. of Otago University, had entered upon the same inquiry and, as the transactions of the New Zealand Institute show, had reached a similar conclusion on similar data. To Dr. Benham, the writer's thanks are gratefully tendered for much help given. For aid in securing the photographs reproduced, he desires to thank Dr. L. Cocaine, FLS, and Reverends A. B. Chapel and H. E. Newton, Messrs. Harold Larkin, G. E. Mannering, A. P. Harper, R. P. Frevel, Malcolm Ross, E. F. Stead, and F. Field. Expeditions into the Kia country have been made possible by the ungrudging kindness of Mrs. Finlayson, late of Glenthorne Station, and Mrs. Murchison, of Lake Coleridge Station. Under this head is especially noteworthy the hearty and splendid assistance of Mr. R. Urquhart, the manager of Mount Algida Station. Thanks are also due to Mr. E. Waite, Mr. Fougere, Mr. A. E. Curry, and Miss Sapsford. In preparation of material revision of manuscript and correction of proofs, the Reverend A. B. Chapel, M. A., has rendered invaluable aid. End of section zero. Chapter One of The Kia, 
The New Zealand Problem by George Reginald Mariner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 1. The Kia Country. Ranges on ranges, far crest on crest. The long out barriers closed to the west, like the walls of the Median city old, a guardian girdle sevenfold. Their grimmest ridges looked softer through the clinging film of their gentle blue, where high in the haze of the summits show the cool, faint streaks of belated snow. William Pember Reeves Have you ever seen the Kia country? The writer has, and the way in which the vision came to him seems worth the telling, especially as an introduction to an attempt to describe and discuss one of the most interesting creatures in a land where the interesting abounds. For years I have longed to see the haunts of the Kia, and when at length a convenient winter vacation came, bringing no call to Rome more pressing than this, I left the laboratory for the mountains. It is not an expedition to be enjoyed alone, but at the last minute my chosen companion failed me, and rather than lose a rare chance, I went without him. My train and bicycle, I gradually wormed my way from Canterbury's city of the plain into the foothill country of the range that stretches along not far from the western edge of our south or middle island of New Zealand. Back of the lesser heights appeared the glistening peaks of the alpine country, where river beds of shingle and terraces of brown tussock and lakes of deep calm occupy the spaces between the sky-piercing points. As I struck in from Glen Tunnel, Mount Hutt towered in front, a gaunt, mute sentinel, 7,000 feet in height, with epaulets and trappings of tussock and a helmet of snow. Nothing daunted, I cycled by him deeper and deeper into the ranges, by the way the Rakaia River has made for itself in its descent from the heights to the plain. Here and there great shingle slides come down the mountain slopes, long streams of broken boulders that creep into the gorge and spread fan-like for a mile or so across its broken expanse. In places the river has shorn them off clean, and their massive walls, often a hundred feet in height, bound the river's torrent. A night was spent at Lake Coleridge Homestead, and then, with my outfit transferred from cycle to horse, I skirted the lake, its wild waterfowl rising in clouds at my approach. About midday I reached the top of the pass. At last, there before me it lay, the lonely, solemn, weird, but fascinating country the Kia chooses for a home. Not a sound broke the great silence as I reined up and gazed across the apparently endless succession of snow-clad peaks. My coming seemed an intrusion, save for the dray track that wound easily down for a mile or so to the riverbed, passing an empty galvanized iron hut as it went. There was no sign of man's presence in this vast wild. Over this scene, looking then, much as it does now, the giant moas, whose remains have been found in the gorge, must have strutted in search of food. Hundreds of feet below lie the Rakaia Forks, where the Wilberforce, Matthias, and Rakaia Rivers unite their forces before they charge down the gorge onto the plains. Their reinforcements are called from all the surrounding peaks. They rush from the terminal faces of the glaciers. They trickle from the snow line. They ripple and bubble through the cushion-like vegetation of the higher slopes. Down amid the dense bush they tumble, forming numerous cascades and waterfalls, here they rattle under a fallen monarch of the forest. There they slip and slide over the great boulders that in vain stand to stem their progress. Down they scramble, seething over the shingle of the riverbed, sweeping round the hill slopes, hurrying to join the roaring river. Where the gorge widens out, the streams of the Rakaia Anastomos, like silvery network, with the tussocky flats filling up the intervals. Farther away lie great swamps, where paradise duck and swamp hen thrive but horse and rider may be hopelessly bogged in awful quagmire. Westward, the three great river beds spread, first for ten or twelve miles as broad U-shaped valleys, and then as deep, precipitous verges, leading away to the supplying glaciers, where the streams are lost to view. Their flood height can be gauged by the broad reaches of naked shingle flanking the water's edge. Everywhere else below, the hardy tussock is supreme. Above, peaks, jagged and white, stretch away to the great heights of the southern Alps themselves. It is all so appallingly gigantic that man seems helplessly insignificant. Behind, running away to the east, the Rakaia cuts its way, first for fourteen miles over a shingle bed about a mile wide, and then for another eight, 
rushing through a narrow defile amid some of the grandest gorge scenery of the Dominion. Away to the left, the Mount Hutt range continues, until it meets the Aerosmith range, capped with snow and girdled with glaciers, standing across the valley. To the right is Peak Hill's lower range, ending in a sharp point, Mount Oakton, cut off from the Rolleston range by the Wilberforce stream, which has been strengthened above by the lesser Harper and Avoca. All around the mountain sides are weathered into great shingle slips, marching down to take possession of the plain, debouching here, uniting forces there, now in file, then in column, but always met by the indomitable tussock. The fight goes on, but the tussock is here unbeaten. Life tells a living dog is better than a dead lion. But these shingle slides, which for size and abundance, are said to be seen nowhere else in the world, and accounted for by brittle strata and very sudden changes in temperature, are an annoyance to the traveller. Travelling is frightfully heavy and slow, and any attempt to ascend their shifting stretches is heartbreaking. As might be expected over this vast wilderness, sparse settlement is only possible. A few lonely homesteads, each, with its shearing sheds and shepherd's huts, are all that can be found in the way of dwellings. The attendant sheds and huts are often separated from each other, and from the central dwelling by miles of mountain range and stony river bed. Each homestead is the center of a sheep station, which often includes many mountain chains. Life in the central dwelling is, as a rule, rigorous, and lonely enough for the most austere hermit. News from the outer world filters in uncertainly, and usually with intervals of many weeks. For the lonely musterer or shepherd, in his detached hut, the life is even worse. Little wonder that now and again one becomes mad or misanthropic. The region is an extremely stormy one. In July of 1907, I stayed some days at the Mount Algida station, a fair sample of those described. It stands about 40 miles back from the plains and includes the Rakaia Forks, shut in among the ranges. On my return journey, I had experience of the fury of the winter tempests that sweep over the area. My attempt to make a dash on horseback for Lake Coleridge Station was made painful and perilous by a snowstorm. It took six hours to do the intervening twenty miles. The drift was blinding, and the snow so caked upon the horse's hoofs that the ride became a stumble through the gale. Soon riding was impossible. The falling snow shut off all but a few yards ahead. Compelled to lead my horse, I fought my way until the pass was crossed and the homestead safely reached. I was fortunate. Such winter traveling in that wild waste is full of dangers. A false step and death may be met. Some years before, on the opposite side of this same gorge, a surveyor was injured by a fall. He lay for days in that land of awful distances, starving, freezing, until his mind wandered and death came to rescue him. His notebook found beside his body told a pathetic tale. He had heard the men shouting to their horses as they dragged supplies up to the Mount Algida station, but the help for which he looked never came. Such storms as I experienced come in close succession in the winter months, burying everything under many feet of snow. The night frosts clutch everything with a grip of iron. Cascades become threads of shining icicles, Nothing but the main body of the streams resist the blinding cold. When spring comes, there is a change, but only doubtfully for the better. The biting blasts give place to the warmer winds from the northwest. These come over the Tasman Sea, getting charged with moisture on the way until they strike the rampart of alpine peaks and pour their burden on the snow. At night, the scene is weirdly grand. The lightning plays among the rocky crests, darting fiery fingers again and again, down into the valleys. A veritable cannonade of thunder shakes the mountain slopes, while sleet and hail sweep ruthlessly everywhere. Soon every crevice in the mountainside sends forth a torrent. The creeks become rushing rivers, and the river itself awakes to fury, losing its winter gentleness for a violence indescribable. Swollen from bank to bank, it becomes a seething, whirling, irresistible flood. It gouges out the bases of the cliffs, and sweeps away the fords, while the roar of its water and the growl of its crunching boulders can be heard miles away. Heavily laden with yellow silt, it rushes out over the plains and discolors the sea for seventy miles out from the coast. The coming of these spring winds effects a devastating transformation. 
well described in the following stanzas from The Norwester, by the late Mrs. F. M. Renner, nay Craig. Then I spring up the slopes of the Alps, but recoil at the touch of their snow, and wrap myself round in cloud, and my angry eyes aglow shoot forth the zigzag lightning. My thunder shakes the air, and I scatter the great drops thick and fast from off my sea-wet hair. But never a whit can the Alps stop me. I leave them soon behind, and revel and dance in maddest glee, a riotous nor'west wind. My warm breath frees the waters, and makes the snow-flowers die, and the sides of the Alps are torn as the torrents hurry by. There's a fresh in the Waimakariri, a flood in the turbid grey. Each swollen river is rushing, or whelming all in its way, and this is my work that none can withstand, nor any power can bind, and I dance and revel throughout the land, a riotous nor'west wind. During midsummer and autumn, only are these vast alpine tracks at all comfortably accessible. This band of alpine country forms the backbone of the South Island and stretches for about 480 miles from one end of the island to the other, lying somewhat to the west. It is composed of long parallel ranges of mountains, many thousands of feet in height, crossed all along their length by shorter transverse ranges, which taper out to the plains. In between these cross ranges, the rivers run, fed all the year round by the alpine snows, and cutting out deep gorges between the mountains, which form picturesque defiles opening to the plains. These river beds form the easiest way of access to the alpine country, and usually a road or track stretches along their high banks, cutting across miles of shingly river bed, over low hills and flat tussocky terraces, until it runs towards the central range, often getting rougher and more hard to follow as it approaches the passes that lead to the west coast. On the east side of the dividing range, the mountains are clothed with tussock grass, which grows up towards the snow line, where it gives place to the subalpine vegetation. Where the rainfall is sufficient, fairly large patches of forest stretch for miles. On the western slopes, owing to the large amount of moisture deposited by the nor'west winds, the barren tussocky scenery changes almost immediately into beautiful snow-clad peaks, covered on their lower slopes by evergreen forest, where ratas, veronicas, oleareas, tree ferns and mosses, form scenes of exquisite beauty. From the sides of the steep forest-clad mountains, foaming cascades and rearing torrents tumble down into the valleys, and, when the upper snows melt, waterfalls of all sizes pour from every depression and gully, forming with the dark evergreen of the bush scenes of unsurpassed loveliness. Here one leaps from the cliff a hundred feet or so above you, and, arching over the roadway, tumbles with a roar into the valley, drenching the traveller with spray as he passes under its watery arch. There one darts out from some bush-clad precipice, and when caught by the wind, spreads itself out for some hundreds of feet along the sides of a dark cliff, like a gigantic silken bridal veil, throwing out iridescent colours as the sunbeams play among its folds. Northward, the alpine country gradually diminishes in height and grandeur, and spreads out almost from coast to coast, forming the hills of Nelson and Marlborough. Southward the ranges rise higher until the chain is crowned by Mount Cook, which well describes its Maori name of Eorangi, or the Heaven Piercer. Snow-clad and grand, it rears up its sharp precipitous peaks, some 13,000 feet, into the air, surrounded by a large number of minor peaks, second only to itself in height and splendor. Here on all sides the valleys are filled with huge glaciers, stretching out to 18 miles in length. The glacier streams, which flow from their terminal faces, fill large glacier lakes. These in turn feed the rivers, which hurry down their gorges to the sea. Southward, beyond this, the mountains spread out and cover Otago and Southland, while to the west the scenery along the main chain increases in imposing loveliness. The rugged barren peaks give place to bush-clad mountains, peak after peak, range after range, they seem to vie with one another in presenting to the traveller scenes most varied and striking. Here a peak, mightier than his comrades, shoots up his hoary crest into the blue, his lower slopes clothed in evergreen forest of rata, lancewood, ferns, and mosses, often so dense as to be impenetrable. As the height increases, the growth dwindles, until near the snow line it gives place to the salmisia and mountain lily, which in turn give place to the cushiony vegetation of the subalpine flora. Above this, plant life ceases to fight against the terrible odds, and the rugged, rocky summits are clad in eternal ice and snow. Alongside this symbol of massive strength and grandeur, 
a deep peaceful lake will be found quietly nestled, which, but for the bush-clad precipices, and the snow-clad peaks reflecting themselves on its surface, and the heavy bush fringing its sides, would fit well in some English country landscape. The whole country about this region is an endless series of craggy peaks, dark mountain gorges, sylvan lakes, picturesque fjords, which for grandeur and beauty are unsurpassed, and draw travellers from all parts of the world to gaze upon them. This long stretch of alpine country is the home of the Kia. Here he reigns supreme. At times he may be seen flying about the snow-clad peaks and the glaciers, or hopping from rock to rock in search of food. Again he may be found in the dense bush, seeking berries or prying curiously into the ways of the homesteads. Here, in a region of mountain, forest, and flood, the bird has lived and flourished for centuries, until man came unbidden. With man came sheep, and with sheep the great temptation, and soon also the fall that has forever blackened the character of these interesting mountain parrots. Even yet, with the brand of Cain upon them, and every man's hand against them, they find a refuge and a home in the mountain fastnesses. End of chapter 1「Description – In the midst, iridescent ward glowing, full-breasted bead-eyed, bright as the Argus showing, not knowing its pride. – Johannes C. Anderson – There is nothing very graceful about the Kia, neither in appearance nor in movement. – he is a clumsy, awkward-looking, olive-green bird, somewhat larger than a domestic pigeon, with a flat head and a long, sharp, curved beak. His legs are short, so that his tail is often dragging on the ground, and when not hopping, at which he is an adept, he moves with an ungraceful waddle. There are four toes on each foot, slate-colored, as is the tarsus, and not only are they placed to each fore and aft, but they are long and seem unfit for much walking. To add to his clumsiness, when walking, the bird often places the tarsus as well as the foot on the ground, so that feathers on the legs touch the ground. When the bird settles after flying, he appears somewhat graceful, but very soon he ruffles his feathers and hides his symmetry. The intensity in the coloring of the plumage varies largely, according to the season of the year or the age of the bird. Often, some appear to be of a dirty, washed-out brownish green, while others have a beautiful olive-green plumage tinted with red and brown. Dull, olive-green feathers edged with black cover the whole body, except for a band of brick-red feathers, upper tail coverts, over the base of the tail, and a large patch of similarly colored feathers under each wing. The green coloration is most vivid on the back and on the sides of the wings, but it gets duller on the ventral surface of the body and towards the head. The outer webs of the large wing feathers, primaries, have a bright metallic blue tint while the inner webs are brownish-black, banded by pale yellow teeth. The undersurfaces of these feathers are similar to the upper, except that the metallic blue color on the outer webs is absent, being replaced by the general blackish-brown hue. The tail feathers are nearly equal in length, and the upper surfaces are olive-green, getting paler towards the tips. They are crossed at their extremity by a black band. The upper mandible, or beak, is smooth and much curved, it is of a brownish-black color, with a lighter yellow tint at its crown. The lower mandible is much shorter and is nearly straight. It is of lighter color, being in the young bird mostly yellow, but darkening to a brownish-black as the bird ages. The eyes are dark brown or black, with a yellow ring of wattle encircling each. There is also some similarly colored wattle, sear, around the nostrils, which in shade varies from a bright to a dull yellow. From a number of specimens kindly lent me by Dr. D. B. Morehouse of Christchurch, I obtained the following average measurements. Length of the bird from the tip of the beak to the end of the tail, 20 and one quarter inches, maximum 23 inches, minimum 18 and one half inches. Length of the upper mandible from tip to gape, 2 and five eighths inches, maximum 2 and three quarters inches, minimum 1 and seven eighths inches. Length of the wing from flexure, carpal, 12 and 3 fifths inches, maximum 13 inches, minimum 12 inches. The female is very similar to the male, but can often be recognized by the duller plumage. 
If one is at all familiar with the birds, the beak and general form are good indications. The female is a more slightly built bird, and the beak is neither so stout nor powerful. There may be some confusion when young birds are encountered, but these can always be identified by the quantity of yellow colouring in the mandibles. Even the young male bird usually has a more heavily built beak than the adult female. Like other members of the genus Nestor, individuals vary much in the brilliancy of their tints, and sometimes the variation is so marked as to give them an albino or a yellow appearance. Professor F. W. Holsom of Christchurch informed me that he saw in one of the Otago homesteads a stuffed kia that was more or less an albino. Sir W. Buller gives the following instance of variation in a specimen procured for him from the interior of Otago. Quote, Bright canary yellow, with a few red feathers interspersed throughout the plumage. Vivid red on the rump and upper tail coverts, as well as under the wings. Such a gorgeous bird has never been seen in the district before. End quote. In the supplement of his New Zealand birds, he says, quote, About 17 years ago, a beautiful yellow kia was obtained in the Wanaka country in the far south. At the time, there was a government bonus of two shillings per head for kias, as the bird had been proving very destructive to the sheep. Every man on the station, as a rule, carried with him a fowling piece on his rounds, and came home at night with a bag full of beaks, thus adding not inconsiderably to his weekly wages. Thousands of pounds were paid in the course of the year, by way of bonus in the Wanaka district alone. The last payment made by my informant was five hundred pounds in one lump sum. It can be gathered by this what the destruction of Kias was at that time. In consequence of this persistent slaughter, they rapidly grew scarcer, till at length there were so few to be seen that the men at work on the round would not encumber themselves with a gun. When the killing fever was at its height, one of the men on delivering his tale of beaks said, quote, I shot today the queerest Kia I ever saw, all yellow. End quote. He added that there was another similar bird, which he could not catch. Finding that the man, after cutting off the beak, had thrown the body aside, the manager sent out to search for the bird, but was unsuccessful, some vagrant dog or hawk having carried it away. In a short time, however, the other was shot and carefully preserved by the manager, who sent his to Mr. C. Turnbull of Dunedin. The bird has since come into my son's possession, and the whole of the body plumage is vivid canary yellow, deepening on the neck and sides of the body and rump into a rich orange-yellow. Most of the scapulars and the quills are of the normal color, except the first primary in each wing, which is yellowish-white. Tail feathers canary yellow, excepting two of the outer lateral ones, which are partly normal. Lining of the wing, delicate orange. Here and there, especially on the head, there is a feather or two of the normal color. To be exact, this abnormal example was obtained at the head of the Shotover River, on the western side of the Motatapu. End quote. Here have come under my notification two malformations of the kia's beak. In eighteen ninety nine, a man photographed a kia that had the upper mandible shot away down to a stump. In spite of this disadvantage, the bird was very strong when seen. I have in my case the head of a kia shot by Mr. R. Urquhart near the homestead of Mount Algidus. The upper mandible, by same means, had been shot wholly or partly away just at the nostrils, leaving nothing but a stump. Since then, apparently, a new beak has grown out above the old stump and has curled round over the lower mandible until it has formed a half circle. The new beak is much narrower at the base than the old one and does not taper to a point, but ends bluntly. Owing to the long curve on the upper mandible, the two beaks would not come close together, and the bird must have found some difficulty in procuring food. However, in spite of this, it was fairly plump when shot, and seemed to have got a good deal of enjoyment out of life. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Kia, A New Zealand Problem by George Reginald Mariner This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 3 Haunts and Habits Mountain lilies shine far up against the snow, and rata's twine on the wooded slopes below. Rata and clematis, sweet as bush may hold, while honey-loving wild birds kiss the kofi's cup of gold. Mary Colborne Veal, 
It is a well-established fact that the kea is found in the mountainous regions of the South Island of New Zealand. But whether it lives among the snow-capped peaks and glaciers, or lower down near the forest line, is a question that has not so far been satisfactorily answered. So much romance has surrounded the bird since its discovery that it is difficult to get people to come down to the sober facts of the case. So popular has it become to describe the kea as the solitary denizen of the lonely snow-bound alpine peaks that even some of our present-day scientists, without taking the trouble to ascertain its real habits, prolong the popular erroneous belief that the kea dwells only amid ice and snow. A recent book states that it lives, quote, up in the mighty mountains where the snow never melts and men seldom go. Sometimes it is driven from its stronghold and is compelled to seek food at lower elevations, end quote. Another writer describes the bird as living, quote, far above the dwarf vegetation in a region often shrouded with mists and driving sleet, end quote. The kia may often be seen soaring among the silent snow-capped heights, yet it by no means spends most of its time there, but is more frequently found at lower levels. Though the mountains in the South Island are high, ranging from five to 13,000 feet, and though in winter they are covered with a thick coating of snow, yet in summer, owing to the warm winds and rain from the northwest, much of their snow is melted. It is, therefore, only on the main dividing range and several other more or less isolated peaks that much snow can be found, and this is often confined to the greater heights. Again, if the kea lives far above the dwarf vegetation, how is it to subsist? And again, is it likely that a bird would make its home in a wilderness of snow and ice when there are better places for nesting, lower down the mountain, among the very vegetation from which it obtains its natural food? From what I have personally seen of the kea's home, it is not a place of eternal ice and snow, but a spot that, in fine weather at all events, is unsurpassed for beauty and situation. Below is the ever-vernal forest, with all its beautiful tints of green, covering the mountain slopes down to the bottom of the valley, where an entrancing panorama of lake, river, and flat spreads out before the eye. Above, the craggy peaks pierce a sky of exquisite blue, while underfoot the subalpine flora, in all its quaint beauty, forms a carpet of cushion-like plants dotted over with small white flowers, like so many stars shining in an emerald sky. Away from the heat of the valley, with a wide, grand outlook and a life-giving atmosphere, the bird has surroundings to be coveted. Sometimes it rises and circles the snowy peaks, but more often it swoops down to where the forest and riverbed meet and revels among the foliage. A good deal of support has been given to the kia's alleged preference for snow and ice, by the fact that travellers, when climbing the Alps, often see the parrot soaring around, and they too readily conclude that this must be its natural environment. It seems to me that nothing could be more natural than that a bird of such known inquisitiveness and keen sight should fly up and investigate the dark figure of the climber as he makes his way over the snow and ice. Sir W. Buller, as early as 1888, made very clear the kia's true habitat, he says, quote, I have seen it soaring or flying, often in parties of three or more, from peak to peak, high above the wooded valley, but it is more generally to be met with on the open mountainside, flying from rock to rock, or hopping along the ground, amongst studded alpine vegetation, in quest of its natural food. End quote. Subsequent writers, however, seem entirely to have passed over this clear statement, and in all the popular articles on the subject, that I have seen, a wrong habitat is given. Sir Julius von Haast saw two kias flying over the godly glacier, but though he saw kias several times while exploring the alpine country of Canterbury, once only did he meet them in perpetually snow-clad regions and amongst glaciers. Another significant fact is that many accounts of sheep killing have come from districts which are situated many miles from the region erroneously described as the kia's home. Dr. L. Cochane in a communication to me, gives what I take to be the kia's correct habitat. He says, quote, I have observed the kia in various parts of the southern Alps, from the Humboldt Mountains in the south to Kelly's Hill in Westland. Although frequently met with on the open alpine and subalpine hillside, I consider the bird essentially one of the forest limit, where it may be seen in numbers at the junction of the forest and subalpine meadows, and in the Nothophagus forest, 
where such are pierced by river beds. End quote. In my travels in the back country, I have frequently made the Kia's acquaintance, mostly around the headwaters of the Rakaia River, and also around Mount Torles. And though I have seen it up as high as five thousand feet or more, my observations agree entirely with Dr. Cocaine's statement. One writer even ridicules the idea of Kia's being forest birds, for he says, quote, I remember being astonished on reading of the Kia living in the forest, for I never, even during the severest winter, saw it perched on trees. End quote. It is a well known fact now that they commonly settle on trees. As early as 1862, Sir Julius von Haast saw one in a tree near Lake Wanaka, and since his time numerous similar testimonies have been born. I have on several occasions seen the Kia perching on trees, once in January 1903 in a forest behind the Glenthorne homestead, and while camping for several days near the source of the Avoca River. I and others constantly saw them flying in and out of the forest some 500 feet above us. The fact that these birds were seen so low down in summer disproves the old statement of many writers that they come down to lower altitudes only in heavy weather. Each time that I saw them low down, it was midsummer, and the weather was warm and clear. At first, I thought that possibly the Kias had come to live at low altitudes, since they had developed sheep-killing propensities, in order to be near to their quarry. But the fact that before they had learned that habit, namely in 1866-67, to 67, Sir Julius von Hust saw more Kias below than above snow line, disproves the supposition. The very fact that in winter, the heavy falls of snow, accompanied by cold biting winds, drive the Kia to lower altitudes, seems to me to indicate conclusively that the bird is not so fond of cold stormy heights as many people suppose. People have often wondered how the birds manage to exist in the alpine country when an excessively heavy fall of snow absolutely covers the land for many weeks, so that even the sheep out on the open hillside are buried so deeply as to prevent the birds molesting them. An experience that came to Mr. R. Guthrie of Burke's Pass throws a good deal of light on this question. Many years ago, he was out looking after sheep on Mistake Station during a heavy downfall, when, walking on the frozen crust of snow on a hillside, he suddenly broke through and sank first into a bed of snow and then through the tops of some scrub on which the smooth sheet of snow was lying. The snow was so thick that, with the tops of the scrub, it made all dark below. Hearing some odd sounds, he struck a match to see what sort of companions he had fallen in with, and there he found several kias busy pecking the ground for grubs and gurgling over their work, and further away he could hear others. Here then was an explanation of the wintering of the kias. The alpine scrub is generally fairly thick where there is any at all, thick enough to form a roof upon which the snow can lie, and stiff enough to bear the weight of it and beneath the scrub and snow roof the kias can be very comfortably housed, out of the reach of frosts and gales, and with a larder under their feet. There may not be much in that larder, but it is enough to keep them alive, till the snow disappears. It is quite a mistake to think that whenever you are in kia country you will see the birds. Considering the vast expanse of country, the kias are comparatively few, and the traveler may spend days and even weeks without ever seeing a single specimen. They seem to have favorite valleys and peaks, and if you can get back into the mountain fastnesses and camp in these places, the kias in their native haunts can usually be seen. At other times, they may be seen in ones and twos, or larger groups, scattered throughout the country, but their appearance on the scene is always an uncertainty. Often they seem to be very timid and fly high up in the air, giving out their characteristic cries as they sail overhead. Sometimes, on the other hand, they become fearless and poke round one's tent and campfire in a way that makes them a perfect nuisance. In some districts, where they were once to be seen in large flocks, the long slaughter has since greatly reduced their numbers. The kia, like other parrots, is normally a vegetarian, with, as one might expect from its connection with the brush-tongued parrots, a strong liking for honey. In addition to this, it is strongly insectivorous, being specially fond of the larvae of the insects, found on the mountains. The late Mr. T. H. Potts says that the kia gathers its subsistence from the nectar of hardy flowers, from the droops and berries of dwarfed shrubs that contend with the rigorous climate 
and press upward almost to the snow line of our alpine giants. To these food resources may be added insects found in the crevices of rocks, beneath the bark of trees, etc. A correspondent in a letter to me on the subject says, quote, The kia eats all the grasses to be found in mountainous country, and besides eating the tender shoots, it is particularly fond of the grain or seeds of the bluegrass. It turns over the stones and gets the larvae of the ants, and also eats worms, grasshoppers, grubs, and beetles. End quote. When the snow covers the subalpine shrubs, and insect life is dormant, the kia is forced to go lower and lower down the mountain to take shelter in gullies, where it feeds on the hard, bitter seeds of kofi, sophra tetratera, small hard seeds in the fruit of pittosporum, the black berries of Aristotelia fruticosa, the native currant, as well as on the fruit of the pitch pine, decridium by form, question mark, and the totra, podocarpus totra. Mr. Huddleston gives its bill of fare as follows, quote, Besides grubs, they feed on the berries of various alpine shrubs and trees, such as the snowberry, Gaultheria caprosma, Panax, Nothopanax, the little black seed in a white skin of Phyllocladus alpinus and Pittosporum, with its hard seed in a glutinous mass, like bird lime, and the red berry of the Podocarpus nivalis, also on roots of various herbaceous plants, Acephila squarosa and A. calenzoi, Ranunculus lyallii, Salmisius, etc. End quote. Professor W. B. Benham, when in the southern Alps, saw some keys eating the orange berries of the low growing heath, Leucopogon fraseri. He says, quote, Two birds were feeding on these berries within two yards of where I was sitting. They ate the juicy part of the berry, putting out the skin and usually the seed also, which I found afterwards on the ground though now and then I heard the bird crack the seed, so that occasionally, at any rate, it swallows this. End quote. A correspondent, writing on this subject, says, quote, I have watched the kia pecking grubs out of a dead tree, and have frequently noticed them picking into the earth for the roots with their beaks. End quote. Another says, quote, I have shot very few kias that have not had mutton in their crops, and next to that are grubs and the roots of aniseed. In summer and autumn, they go for berries, such as snowberries, etc., and also the honey out of the flax seed, Formium tenax. End quote. Miss Eva C. Izard of Christchurch has placed me under obligation by putting her kias through a special course of food in order to ascertain their particular tastes. And in addition to this, so tame was one of them that it was given at certain times the run of the orchard and grounds, and so could help itself to many native plants found there. In this way, observing the birds under circumstances as natural as possible, Miss Izard was able to supply me with much useful information regarding their natural foods. I cannot do better than quote her letter. Quote, I have been putting the kia through a course of native berries as far as practicable. He likes caprosma best, but he never eats the seed, only the outside. Conini, fuchsia excorticata, will suit him, but he only eats it out of politeness, not with avidity. He declines the honey out of the white and crimson coromico, Veronica species. But Mr. King, one of her kias, used to love the flowers of V. Hothiana and V. Fairfieldii, only next best to the yellow kofi, to which he was as nearly devoted as to the broadleaf flowers. Even when no flowers were out on the broadleaf, he could always be found busy pecking at the bark of the branches but I could never find out what he got there. He disliked five-fingered jack in seed, but patronized the flowers, and was fond of nipping off branches of it. There is a tall umbrella tree, with parsonsia climbing over it, up which he often spent a very busy hour or two in spring, though I can't say what he was sucking. He never cared to go up at any other season. Cabbage trees, cordyline, matopos, pittosporum, birches, rangioras, brachyglottis, Rangiora, Mickey Mickey, Cyathodes acerosa, and New Zealand holly, Oliaria alicifolia, were never interfered with, nor was Libertia grandiflora, but he always made a dart for the mountain lily, Ranunculus lyallii, and daisies, Salmisia species, roots, as soon as ever he was out of his cage. Mr. King never interfered with the English trees except one oak, and he never could resist cherry trees when the fruit was ripe. Lettuces ranked next in favor to dandelion, Taraxacum officinalis, 
roots, of which he was very fond, I think because they reminded him of Maori onions, Bobanella species, as he always made a point of demolishing each plant he got. He seemed to need roots for his digestion. He was never so well when he did not have them two or three times a week. The key is always like a flax honey, though they don't care for the seeds. In fact, honey seems much more to their taste than berries, except the caprosma. End quote. The above accounts seem to me to give a fair idea of the Kia's food supply before it took to sheep killing. One can easily imagine him in spring and summer fossicking in the cushiony vegetation of the subalpine meadows for insect larvae or flying in and out of the bush in search of honey and fruits. While in autumn and winter he would be searching for insects among the crevices of the rocks or eating the berries of the forest. Now that he has taken to sheep killing, much of his spare time is used in worrying the sheep and in winter the mutton must make a welcome addition to his scanty larder. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of The Kia, A New Zealand Problem by George Reginald Mariner This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gail Timmerman Vaughan Chapter 4 Nesting But o'er my isles the forest drew a mantle thick, save where a peak shows his grim teeth a snarl, and through the filtered coolness creak and creak, tangled in ferns in whispers speak. And there the placid great lakes are, and brimming rivers proudly force their ice-cold tides. Here, like a scar, dry-lipped, a withered watercourse crawls from a long-forgotten source. Arthur H. Adams Though the Kia has become, during the last forty years, the most notorious of all our New Zealand fauna, Yet so cunning was the bird and so secluded was its retreat that it is only during the last few years that we have pierced the uncertainty that hung around its home life and have been allowed to gaze with curious eye upon its nest. The information concerning its home life that has come to hand in recent years is quite in keeping with the notoriety of the bird and it can be safely said that its breeding habits are the most striking and interesting of those of our avifauna. Were the Kia surrounded by countless enemies, it could not have chosen a more impregnable fortress in which to rear its young. It is a veritable Gibraltar, and as such, it usually remains unmolested. Not only is the country in which the Kia lives dangerous, as well as difficult to travel over, but it is in some of the most inaccessible places in that most inaccessible country, high up in the mighty peaks, that the Kia makes its home. I cannot improve upon the graphic description of the Kia's home, given by Mr. T. H. Potts. Quote, it breeds in the deep crevices and fissures, which cleave and seam the sheer faces of almost inaccessible cliffs, that in places bound, as with massive ramparts, the higher mountain spurs. Sometimes, but rarely, the agile musterer, clambering among these rocky fastnesses, has found the entrance to the run used by the breeding pair, and has peered with curious glances tracing the worn trail till its course has been lost in the dimness of the obscure recesses beyond the climber's reach. In these retreats, the home or nesting place generally remains inviolate, as its natural defenses of intervening rocks defy the efforts of human hands, unless aided by the use of heavy iron implements that no mountaineer would be likely to employ. End quote. Even if the ardent collector manages with great care to reach the nest, and is able to obtain a foothold on the side of the cliff, he will often find that a crowbar will make little impression on the opening of the run, and nothing less than a charge of blasting powder would suffice to force an entrance. It is a mistake to suppose that the Kia builds always in such inaccessible positions, though they seem to be the favorite places. The choice is influenced, to a large extent, by the nature of the surrounding country. If the mountain sides are pierced by these long, narrow tunnels, running for many feet into the rock, these are used but if they are not available, the Gia makes use of whatever comes to hand, such as a cairn of stones, or a hole in a clay bank. Even as late as 1882, its egg was unknown to science, and Mr. Potts at that time said it was yet to be described. Even today, Kia's eggs are scarce, and one collector has a standing offer to pay one pound per egg. Though there are several rough descriptions of Kia's nests already published, I have never seen a description that goes into much detail and, as far as I know, there were no photographs of nests until those I got were secured. 
In order to see a nest myself, and also to procure some photographs of the tunnels in which the Kia builds, I made an excursion up the Rakhaya Gorge, into the heart of the Southern Alps, in July of 1907. Through the kindness of Mr. R. Urquhart, the manager of Mount Algida Station, I was able to make my headquarters at that homestead, one of the centres of the Kia-infested districts. In 1906, Mr. Urquhart had discovered a nest in a gorge, and, as it was practically undamaged, he had offered to lead me to the spot if I could pay him a visit. The day of our excursion was preceded by a night of heavy hail and snowstorms, which swept round the homestead with terrific force. The morning broke wet and gloomy, and the whole adjacent country was enveloped in driving clouds and sleet. Nothing could be seen of the mountain ranges that hemmed us in on every side, except their wooded bases, over which torrents of muddy water streamed down to the valley. It was ideal weather to see the Kia, but certainly not the weather one would have chosen for a long ride on horseback, in order to take photographs on an open mountainside. We were away in good time, and, with my camera protected with sex, we slowly made our way over the saddle that separated us from the Matthias River. We crossed the summit in the face of a biting wind, and took the track leading down to the river flat. This was steep and slippery, and it was only the sure-footedness of the horses that prevented nasty falls. Once down onto the river bed, we found the air less keen, but the sleet and low-hanging clouds made the scene lonely and depressing. Quote, Just the weather, end quote remarked Mr. Urquhart to me, quote, for the Kias to kill sheep, end quote. For a long time we rode on, with the river on one side, and the snow-clad Rolleston Range on the other, until we suddenly came upon some proof of the Kias' presence. On the ground, in front of us, a fine merino ram lay dead, with a ghastly hole torn in its back, and its neck stretched out, as if it had died in agony. Having photographed it, we pushed on to where the Chimera Creek joins the Matthias River, and here, tethering our horses to the bushes, we commenced to climb the steep, slippery side of Jack's Hill. The Chimera Creek flows almost through the center of the hill, and on its way has cut a deep, narrow gorge, which is about 200 yards wide, where the stream issues onto the river flat. This gorge runs back for some miles towards the center of the range. On each side, high and perpendicular cliffs shut out the sunlight, and, rising as they do from 200 to 1,000 feet in height, they form a long, narrow, deep gorge. At last we came to the nest which, fortunately for us, was not in an altogether inaccessible position, but situated in a long, narrow tunnel, whose opening was in a small ravine, running at right angles to the top of the gorge and opening over it. It was situated on the top of the western cliff, but, owing to the walls of rock rising sheer out of the bed of the creek, we could not get a foothold anywhere. In order to reach it, we had to climb along the top of the cliff. Owing to the thick drizzle that had now set in, and the fact that the ground sloped to the edge of the gorge, we had to take great care that we did not slip over into the dark ravine below. In August 1906, while trying to destroy some kias that had been killing sheep for some time, Mr. Urke discovered the nest, and determined not only to rob it, but at the same time to kill the old birds. So, one night, with several of his men, armed with spades and crowbars, he climbed along the edge of the cliff, but owing to the darkness they were unable at first to locate the nest. As a last resort, one of the men imitated the well-known call of the kia, and the little ones in the nest immediately responded. The opening of the run in which the nest was situated was thus found. Yet, owing to the narrowness of the tunnel, the men were still unable to reach the nest. However, with the aid of a crowbar, a large rock was removed from the entrance, and the young birds were captured. The mother bird was killed, and the men put the little ones inside their shirts for warmth and safety, and they were thus carried back to the station. The father bird escaped, and, though Mr. Urquhart returned the next day, and stayed an hour or two about the place, he did not catch a glimpse of him until, about to give up the search in despair, he espied the old fellow watching in artful silence from a tree, where he had probably been perched throughout the proceedings. The bird carefully avoided any closer acquaintance. As no one had been near the nest since then, it was almost intact when we found it, and with the exception of the stone removed from the entrance, it was just as the birds had used it. To call their breeding place a nest is almost to use a misnomer, for the birds choose a natural tunnel in the rocks, one with a narrow opening, just wide enough to allow them to pass in and out, and then place a few pieces of tussock grass at the far end, where the female lays her eggs. 
Such was the one I saw. The tunnel, or run, went about six feet into the rock. The opening, after the removal of the large stone, was in the shape of a triangle. The distance from apex to base was fourteen inches, and the base measured nineteen inches. I squeezed in as far as I could and found, on lighting a match, that the tunnel narrowed as it approached the end, and here in the narrowest part the nest was placed. This nest, at the time it was robbed, contained four young birds. On the opposite side of the small ravine were the remains of another nest, but the opening was so narrow that I could not even get my head in, and nothing less than dynamite would have widened it. This hole was thirty inches deep and thirteen inches across at its widest part, but it narrowed rapidly as it left the surface. It ran back some ten feet into solid rock, and there again enlarged greatly. After taking notes of both nests, I set to work to photograph them, and not only was the situation awkward, owing to the proximity of the cliff, but our troubles were augmented by the rain and mist, which, owing to the lateness of the afternoon, made the light very feeble. However, as I had come especially to obtain photographs of this phase of the Kia's life history, I fixed my camera up in the wet, and, after consulting photometer, gave the plates nearly fifteen minutes' exposure. Fortunately, on development, the negatives came up well. As already remarked, I think they are the first photographs ever taken of a Kia's nest. While trying to trap some Kias on the Glenthorne homestead in January 1908, Mr. Edgar F. Stead was fortunate enough to find a Kia's nest, which he describes as follows. Quote, a bird came over and began calling, but would not come near the traps, staying down by the male bird we had caught the night before. I went back and saw her, with tail spread and wings drooping, run to the edge of a bluff, and fly off into the ravine without a sound. I guessed immediately that she had a nest, and as soon as there was enough light, we started looking for it. When we were just giving up hope of finding it, and were going to turn the male bird loose and follow him, we heard the female call away down in the bottom of a big rock slip, and I caught a glimpse of her as she moved. Hurrying to the spot, we found a lot of loose feathers and droppings which indicated the presence of a nest. We soon located it in a long hole, the entrance of which was formed by two enormous boulders, which leaned against one another, forming a triangular space, partly blocked by a third stone. This ladder we removed by using a thick vine as a rope, and after much scratching and scraping, I reached in, and striking a match, saw the bird on her nest. More scraping and digging among the small stones and earth, and again I reached in, but quickly withdrew my hand, minus a small piece of the middle finger. I then wrapped a handkerchief round my hand, and very soon had the bird out. I handed her to Mr. Murchison to hold, and she immediately took a piece out of his coat and clawed him pretty thoroughly. But my attention was on the nest, and to my joy, I found four pure white eggs. They were laid on the ground among a few chips of rotten wood and bark, about five feet from the entrance of the hole. More than satisfied with our night's work, we returned to the lake, and that afternoon H. and myself, with many thanks for the hospitality and assistance we had received, left for the point en route for home. End quote. As the Kia is really king of the Alps, and drives all other birds away from its domain, it is difficult to explain the reason why it chooses such a stronghold for its nest. It is only of late years that the weasels and stoats introduced from Europe have made their way up to the snow line, and I doubt if these rodents would be a match for an infuriated Kia. The most likely reason is, I think, that nesting as they do in a season of fierce storms and cold weather, and their young having to stay for some months in the nest, the parent birds are forced to choose a place where the young may be kept warm and dry. The Kia's breeding season commences about June, and is continued on to September, or even later. The usual time for the eggs to be laid is in July, though some say that eggs have been seen in June. This is, however, the exception, rather than the rule. I think it is one of the most striking and interesting facts in New Zealand ornithology that the kia, living in alpine country, where the severity of the winter is especially felt, builds its nest, lays its eggs, hatches and rears its young, all during the severest months of the winter. During this time, its domain is swept by a succession of severe storms of cold wind, accompanied by snow, which covers the ground many inches deep for months. And when the sky is clear, very severe frosts set in, which turn everything into a solid frozen mass. That some birds in warm countries nest in the winter is known, 
but that a bird should rear its young in winter, at an altitude of from 3,000 to 5,000 feet, in a country where even near the sea level the other birds dare not nest until the spring comes, is to say the least most extraordinary. Footnote. The fact that Mr. E. F. Stead found a nest with eggs early in January 1908 seems to show that the birds may nest at any time of the year, the choice depending largely on the severity of the seasons and the time when the severe storms occur. End of footnote. Again, not only must the parents have a difficulty in finding food for themselves among the often frozen surroundings, but at this most difficult time of year they have to supply extra food for their young. So far I have heard of no good reason why the kia should nest in midwinter, and I know of none, unless it be to enable the young to be fully developed before the severe weather again comes around. The eggs, of which as many as four have been found in one nest, are naturally rare and difficult to obtain. They are about the size of the egg of a domestic pigeon, and in appearance are white, with rough shell and no markings. Through the kindness of Dr. B. Morehouse Christchurch, I am able to take notes from six eggs in his collection. The results are given in the following table. Rangitata gorge, length 4.8 centimeters, breadth 4 centimeters, long circumference 14.5 centimeters, broad circumference 11 centimeters, maximum. Rakaya gorge A, length 4.2 centimeters, breadth 3.4 centimeters, long circumference 11.5 centimeters, broad circumference 10.5 centimeters, minimum. Rakaya gorge B, length 4.2 centimeters, breadth 3.5 centimeters, long circumference 11.5 centimeters, broad circumference 10.4 centimeters. Rakaya gorge C, length 4.4 centimeters, breadth 3.3 centimeters, long circumference 11.2 centimeters, broad circumference 10.7 centimeters. Mount Cook A, length 4.5 centimeters, breadth 3.4 centimeters, long circumference 12 centimeters, broad circumference 10.3 centimeters. Mount Cook B, length 4.5 centimeters, breadth 3.4 centimeters, long circumference 12 centimeters. Broad circumference, 10.5 centimeters. Average, length, 4.43 centimeters. Breadth, 3.45 centimeters. Long circumference, 12.29 centimeters. Broad circumference, 10.57 centimeters. The eggs vary somewhat in size and shape, as can be seen from the above table, but otherwise there seems to be very little difference. The young birds stay in the nest for an exceptionally long time. One correspondent states that he found young ones in September, and took them out of the nest in December, and from all accounts they seem to stay until they are nearly fully grown. The young kia's cry somewhat resembles that of the fully grown bird, but it is weaker and very plaintive. The fledglings' one drawback as pets is that, even when kept in clean apartments, they have a most objectionable odor. Mr. Urquhart was good enough to send me two live kia nestlings from Mount Algidus, and I was therefore able to see for myself these interesting birds at this stage of their development. They were about two months old when I received them at Christchurch, but though they were nearly the size of a small pigeon, they were quite unable to move about or feed themselves. Their wings were fairly strong, and were sometimes flapped when food was given to them. Their legs were large, yet they seemed devoid of capacity for muscular action, and were never used. Indeed, so helpless were they, that when being photographed they did not stir from the position in which they were placed. They kept very healthy, and had an ever-increasing appetite for food. Since their capture, nearly two months before, they had been fed on strips of kidney, which had to be poked down their capacious throats with a small stick. The following is a description, taking two months after hatching. Head, beak, upper mandible large and black in color, with the exception of a slight tinge of yellow on the top of the arch. It is neither so long nor so curved as that of the adult bird. Lower mandible, of a yellow color, except the tip which is black. The wattle around the nostrils is plentiful and of a light yellow color, the mouth large, with a drooping sac-like structure on each side of the angle of the beak, which stretches for some distance toward the tips of the mandible. These sacs were very conspicuous, being composed of a yellow material closely resembling wattle, and their function seems to be to prevent the food tumbling out of the mouth, for when the beak is open the two sacs are stretched across the gape of the mouth and form a safe passage for the food to pass down. Body. Most of the body, except under the wings, is covered with short quills or feathers. 
those expanded, resemble the adult plumage, being dark green fringed with dark brown. The tail feathers of the wings and tail are just coming out of their quills. The legs are large, dark gray in color, with black claws, very weak in muscular action, and at present useless. The body and head are still to a large extent covered with long light gray down, which, however, is fast disappearing. The larger bird was able, after a few days, to swallow food by itself, but the smaller one still required the food to be poked down its throat. The suggestion has been made that, owing to the continued change of diet in the kia, the taste for meat has become hereditary, and in proof of this it is stated that young kias, only a few days old, have been known to eat meat. As far as I can ascertain, there is at present no proof in support of the suggestion, for though young kias can be nourished for some time on meat, this in itself does not prove that the taste for it is natural. Other cases are known where birds have taken readily to a new diet, and yet heredity could have no influence in the matter. Through the kindness of Dr. Cocaine and Mr. E. Jennings, I am able to publish the following incident. While they were on a tour of the southern islands of New Zealand in the government steamer Hene Moa, in 1904, a specimen of the flightless duck, Nessonetta Aucklandica, was captured and brought alive to Dunedin. From the time of its capture, it was fed solely on bread and milk, which it seemed to take too readily. Now, this duck is found only on the Auckland Islands, where it feeds on crustaceans, etc., which are found among the rocks and the kelp, Dervilia, of the seashore. These islands are uninhabited and are practically never visited by any ship except the government steamer Hinemoa, which pays them a semi-annual visit. It can almost be taken for certain that this particular bird had never seen bread, much less tasted it, and yet when caught, it at once took to this new food so entirely different from its natural supply. Mr. C. V. Rides, of the Acclimatization Gardens, Christchurch, in a letter to me on the native birds, says that when kept in captivity, they change their character to a large extent, and the wild duck, whose natural food is largely young green shoots and herbs, and any small freshwater animals available, prefers cakes and buns to the usual wheat and maize. If birds, as in the cases cited, take readily to new food, it seems to me that the mere fact that young kias will eat meat does not in any way prove that the taste has become hereditary. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five at Play Living real, alert for charm or evil, hurrying in every breeze and haunting, heavy winged, the vistas of the forest. Arthur H. Adams The kia may be a marked bird throughout the whole dominion. It may ravage the flocks and bring dismay to the sheep farmer, but for all this, there can be no gainsaying the fact that it is a most lively and interesting companion. In places where it has not been too much harassed by the kia hunter, it shows little fear of man, and the traveler can always depend on an hour or two of amusement whenever the bird appears. When one is camping out among the ranges, the birds often come round and amuse themselves at the traveler's expense. They seem to take the whole oversight of the preparations for camp. They investigate the campfire. They pull the cooking utensils about, they test the strength of the tent ropes, and if not driven away, they will scatter the contents of the swag far and wide. Indeed, you can never suffer from ennui while they remain with you, for, while you are driving one away from your tent, another will be trying his beak on the coat that you have hung up on a tree for safety. With their merry eyes and their shining coats, their perky ways and their tameness and extreme inquisitiveness, they are welcome and unwelcome at the same time. The kia is one of the most inquisitive birds imaginable, and indeed it is this trait in his character that has partly brought about his downfall. Kias make a loud din when together, and when one is camping out, their incessant screeching and calling are a perfect nuisance in the early mornings, sleep being often impossible. However, the trouble does not stop there. They will often pay a visit of inspection to the tent, and keep one on the qui vive as to what new mischief they will do. Perhaps you hear them rattling the cooking utensils about. That is the merest trifle, but when they begin to tear the tent, there is nothing to do but to get up and strike camp as soon as possible. An experienced kia hunter says, quote, There is something freakish about the kia. 
You have got to the high tops and perhaps have rested on a rock, keenly alert for any signs of your quarry. There is no indication of a kia being within a mile of you, but after you have started again and looked back, there is a kia on the very spot that you have just left. Where it comes from is a mystery you don't pretend to solve, but this is the kia's way. Sometimes it will shriek to let you know that it is near at hand. Other times it will silently appear on your side, coming apparently from nowhere. End quote. They seem to be exceptionally lively around the ball hut, Mount Cook, in the early morning, for numbers of tourists complain of their noise. Mr. Fitzgerald, in his book, Climbing in the New Zealand Alps, describes them thus, quote, The Kia parrots disturbed our sleep that night by walking up the iron roof and, to judge from the sounds, tobogganing down and falling off the edge, with shrieks of terror and rage, end quote. Several people have actually seen them tobogganing down the corrugated iron roofs, sliding down on feet and tail, following one another in line, falling off when they reach the edge of the roof, and then flying away with shrieks of delight. Dr. F. W. Hilgendorf gives the following instances of their quaint ways. Quote, the kia occurs in large numbers, up to 45 being seated on the roof of the ball hut at one time, and I myself saw them every morning that I stayed there. There is one that always comes round when any visitors arrive. The hut is built on a little stone platform, and, when boots are put there to dry, the kia always pulls them off and throws them over the platform, rolling them with his head from behind, if they are too heavy to pull with his beak. He will even go into the hut and pull boots out from there. He has also been seen to roll stones down a hill, apparently with the object of watching their fall. All the kias about the hut exhibit great curiosity. And when an alarm clock went off in the building, they gathered round shrieking at the top of their voices. When a rag was thrown to them, about six of them would swarm onto it and pull it to pieces. But they still more delight in pulling out the packing of a saddle or any other object which presents sufficient resistance. They even settled on the backs of the horses that are taken to the ball hut, four or five getting on the back of one horse, clawing and scratching there until the horse kicks up, and drives them away. End quote. They are not so tame now as they were in the early days, but their curiosity is so great that, if anything takes their fancy, they come and inspect it, and talk to one another, and shake their heads, like a group of solemn judges. Mr. Fitzgerald gives an interesting instance, which he noted when on Mount Cook. Quote, they were so tame, end quote. He says, quote, that if you sit down quietly for a few minutes, and held up any bright object that glittered in the sun, they would come and hop all over you, curiosity apparently being their strongest characteristic. On this present occasion, their chief interest seemed to center on a nickel-plated drinking cup, which I had laid on the rocks close by to dry. They are of an inquisitive nature, and did not rightly gather what the shiny object might be meant for, so they came up in line and circled round it, one or two of the bolder spirits even picking at it. This evidently did not satisfy them, so they retired to a neighboring rock and gathered in a group to consult, which meant a tremendous screeching and jabbering. It is the manner of Kias to gather together thus and talk to one another in a way which seems quite comprehensible to themselves. We threw stones at them to try and make them shift their quarters, but this only had the effect of bringing them back to renew their investigation. Finally, we stopped their hideous clamor by hiding the drinking cup, whereupon they slowly dispersed with an injured air. End quote. Not only do they worry and plague the traveler while he is in camp, but they often follow him up a mountain, as though loath to see the last of him. Mr. A. P. Harper gives the following amusing incident in his book. Quote, Ever since sunrise I have been the object of considerable attention from some kias. At first there were only two or three, but afterwards their numbers increased to fifteen or more. They joined me on the south side of the Fox Glacier and annoyed me considerably by their inquisitiveness, while I was taking some bearings and photographs, one of them alighting on my back as I was looking at my compass. When crossing the Chancellor Ridge, the kias that I referred to followed me on the wing, but owing to the ice being very slippery, my progress was too slow for them. Therefore, alighting on the ice, they began to follow me on foot. Whenever a kia makes its appearance, we are prepared for some good fun, as their antics are most ludicrous, and their conversation, which is incessant, is almost expressive enough to enable one to understand what they mean. 
I have had considerable experience with these birds, but have never seen such an extremely funny proceedings as on this particular morning. The Kias, having settled on the ice, began to follow in a long, straggling line, about fifteen of them. They have a preternaturally solemn walk, but when in a hurry they hop along on both feet, looking very eager and very much in earnest. To see these fifteen birds hopping along behind in a string, as if their lives depended on keeping me in sight, was ridiculously comic. The ice was undulating with little valleys and hummocks, and the birds would now for a second or two disappear in a hollow, and now show on a hummock pause a moment, and then hop down again, out of sight into the next hollow. To judge by their expressions and manners, they were in a great state of anxiety on emerging from a hollow to a hummock as to whether I was still there. Now and then the one in front would appear craning his neck, and, on seeing me still ahead, would turn round and shriek, Kia! as much as to say, It is all right, boys, come along. And the others, putting their heads down, would set their teeth, or rather their beaks, and travel for all they knew, a fat one in the rear, evidently making heavy weather of it. End quote. They seem to be ever on the lookout for mischief, and when a good joke is in view, they take good care not to lose it. A story is told of a dog that was lying asleep near a hut, when several kias came down and, evidently bent on mischief, walked round him laying their plans. The boldest kia then crept up and bit the dog's tail, thus causing him to wake up and growl. But hardly was his head laid down on the ground again, when Kia number two had a pull. This went on for some time, until at last the dog got tired of it, and retired growling to the veranda. Their playfulness, though amusing, often becomes a great nuisance, as they can do a lot of damage in a very short time. The late Mr. Potts is responsible for the following story. Quote, on one occasion a hut was shut up, as the shepherd was elsewhere required for a day or two. On returning he was surprised, to hear something moving within the hut, and on entering, he found that it proceeded from a kia, which had gained access by the chimney. This socially disposed bird had evidently endeavored to dispel the ennui attendant on solitude by exercising his powerful mandibles most industriously. Blankets, bedding, and clothes were grievously rent and torn. Pannikins and plates were scattered about. Everything that could be broken was apparently broken very carefully. Even the window frames had been attacked with great diligence. End quote. Another case is told of these birds, and their love of fun or mischief, as the case may be. Quote, On a back country sheep run, a mule, packed with a full load of stores and sundries for one of the outstations, was peacefully pursuing its way, when on a sudden a kia perched on the neck of the animal. The unexpected arrival was too much for the gravity of the mule. Startled from its accustomed demure and patient demeanor, it plunged and kicked, till it had freed itself from the kia, as well as its well-packed burden. End quote. A shepherd from the back country says that, quote, tents get a fair amount of attention from the kia. I have left a tent in the morning in good order and condition, and when I returned at the end of a day's muster, I have found it torn beyond repair, and the birds seem to be quite enjoying the fun. Clothes hung out to dry at the shepherd's huts or camps, often get torn up, colored clothes more than white. I, along with two or three other men at a musterer's camp, saw a kia take a piece the size of its beak out of a Turkish towel with one peck, almost as clean as it could have been done with a pair of scissors. The towel was almost a new one, so that you will have an idea of the strength of the beak. End quote. A botanist was one day working among the ranges, and for convenience's sake, left a bundle of precious specimens on a rock. A kia, that must have had a decided taste for botany, began to investigate. And when the man returned, he found that the whole of his rare collection had been tumbled down the precipice, far beyond recovery. Not only do they play the most outrageous pranks, but they often display a good deal of method in their madness. One of my correspondents gave me the following instance. Quote, to show you how tame and inquisitive a kia is, I was one day resting on a hill when one perched on my shoulder. I caught him and put him in a box an inch thick, but he cut it through by the morning and got out. I then chained him with a dog's chain, with a leather strap round his leg. The kia would run the iron chain through his beak until he got to the leather, and then, with a stroke or two of his beak, he cut it right through. End quote. Mr. Kinsey of Christchurch narrates the following curious incident concerning the kia's 
at Mount Cook Hermitage. Wishing to take some live keys to town, he had several placed in a wooden box, and in order to secure them, he placed several fairly large stones on top of the cage. His daughter, some time afterwards, found that the stones had been removed, so after putting them on again, she went and told her father. He, however, knew nothing about their removal, but by keeping watch, he was able to discover the culprits. Through his field glasses, he saw several birds alight on the box, and by dint of pushing with their heads down, they were able to roll the stones off. Whether it was done for fun, as the birds have been known to do with the hermitage, or whether it was done as an attempt to rescue their imprisoned mates, I am not prepared to say. At the shepherd's hut at the Mount Algida station, there was a tame Kia, who kept the inmates from becoming dull by the mischief into which he was always getting. What he loved most of all was to creep into the kitchen, when the cook was absent, and try all the tempting dishes on the table. He would sample the butter, put his feet into the milk, take a mouthful of jam, upset the sugar basin, and would usually end up by walking into the treacle pot. When he heard the cook returning, he would make a dash for the door, and as his feet were more or less gripped by the treacle, he would upset the pot and leave the table in a state of chaos. At other times, he would interfere with the bread and try the meat, but as soon as he saw the cook's hand steal towards the long-handled broom, the bird almost fell over himself in his anxiety to get to the door. Outside, he worried the kittens and fowls, and once, while playing with a ball of string, he got so tangled up that he had to be helped to get free. The birds make very interesting pets, but are very noisy and destructive, and they need a very strong cage in which to confine them. Though very tame and inquisitive, they are not so easily caught in their wild state as one would imagine. To give a good idea of this, I cannot do better than quote from a short article by Mr. E. F. Stead of Christchurch, who has devoted much splendid practical investigation to the bird life of New Zealand. He gives the following graphic account. Quote, the call bird, which had never been in a small cage before, and was very wild when we first put her in the evening before, had got quite used to the surroundings, and had learned how to hang on with her feet and beak, so that she was not knocked about when being carried. It is marvelous how quickly a keel will adapt itself to circumstances. This particular bird, after I had carried her on my back for five or six hours, got so accustomed to the motion that she would call softly to herself, or eat strawberries out of my hand, as we went along. If the climbing was rough and the cage was temporarily upside down, she would brace herself with feet and beak, and quietly wait until she was righted. So quiet, indeed, did she become, and so docile, that we called her Angela. We chose a rocky promontory, with a stunted birch on the end of it for our traps, as it commanded a fine view of the gully, and could be seen from our camp. Quote, Here we set our traps, and it being already dark, we returned to the camp for the night. One of the call birds we kept in a wire netting run near the tent, and also inside of the bird up by the traps. The advantage of this was that if our distant bird saw others early in the morning and began calling, the bird at camp would answer and wake us up. At about half past four next morning, our ornithological alarm went off, and I got up and hurried up the mountainside. When halfway up to the traps, I heard a wild screaming behind me, and looking round saw him sailing over me from across the gully. Almost immediately two others further up answered, and all three presently arrived at the traps. They were a pair and an old male bird, and I sat quietly among the tussocks a few yards away, waiting for them to rush joyfully into the traps after the meat. But not a bit of it. After thoroughly inspecting Angela and her cage, and bestowing a casual glance at the traps, they came over and subjected me to a searching scrutiny. Finding that I was an object of interest to them, I moved nearer to the traps, and tried in vain to call their attention to the dainty viands displayed therein. It was no use. If I sat quite still, they went over and had a chat with Angela, sitting on the roof of her cage the while. But if I moved, they hopped blithely round me and my ways. The place they did not hop on was the space covered by the traps. As they came quite fearlessly to within a few feet of me, I decided to try and snare them. So I went into a little clump of bush nearby and got a rod and piece of fine creeper for a noose. The keys accompanied me, hopping round in the trees above my head, while I cut the stalk and prepared my snare. Having got everything ready, I returned to the promontory and squatted quietly down under a big boulder. Almost instantly a head appeared over the edge above me, 
and the owner of it gave a quiet little call. Another head appeared, and another, and then, within three feet of me, the birds sat and watched me, with a whole world of curiosity in their bright little eyes. Gently I raised the snare and brought it towards the middle one. He took no notice until it was almost over his head, and then he quietly took it on his beak and began chewing it. Realizing that I could not snare them, I went halfway down the hill and called to H to bring up a coil of wire netting that he had. This we used to make a little run at the entrance of which we placed Angela in her cage, hoping that we could drive the wild birds into it. But half an hour's vain endeavor convinced us of the futility of this scheme. Then I decided that I would return to camp for a camera so that I could photograph the birds, even though unable to capture them. I descended via a shingle slide, and the noise of the stones rattling down with me attracted the birds, which accompanied me down to camp. And when I got back with the camera, only one had returned. The sun had by this time risen over the mountain behind us, and the day was bright and hot. Everything was propitious for good pictures, but before I had the camera ready, the bird flew screeching up the gully. Very disappointed and hot, we returned to camp. That evening at four o'clock, we again climbed to the traps. Shortly after our arrival, we saw a bird, and I called it down, when it proved to be the unattached male of the morning, readily distinguished by the state of his molt. We set a trap out on the ledge of a rock, evening up the surface with small stones. The bird came down, and taking the stones one by one, dropped them over the edge. Next, standing well outside the trap, he began chewing one of the sticks, with the result that the cage fell down. It was very laughable, but it scared the kia and he flew away. Nor did we see him again. End, quote. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of the Kia: A New Zealand Problem by George Reginald Mariner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter Six: Early Records. Like a black hawk swooping, I shall whirl upon the southern island, sweep it with my name as with a tempest, overrun it like a play of sunlight, sigh across it like a flame, till terror runs before me, shrieking. Arthur H. Adams. It was not until about ten years after the discovery of the Kia that the bird began to acquire the bad habit that has since been its downfall and can end only in its complete extermination. From being one of the least known of our avifauna, its name soon became a byword throughout the dominion, and its specific cognomen, notabilis, became only too appropriate. When killing sheep for home consumption on the Lake Wanaka Station, northwest Otago, in 1867, the shepherds noticed from time to time what they took to be a new disease on the loins of the animals. And during shearing in 1868, these mysterious scars were again observed. On close inspection, the supposed disease revealed severe wounds in different stages of healing or festering. On some sheep, there was merely a patch of bare skin, but on others, there was either a half-healed wound or a raw patch of festering flesh, while others again, had each a large hole torn in the side, from which the entrails were often protruding. Many a long discussion was held as to who the culprit could be, but no one could throw any light on the mystery. One man did suggest that the Kia might be the author of the damage, but he was ridiculed so unmercifully that he thought it wise not to repeat his suggestion. Suspicion fell at once on the black-backed gull, Laura's domestic henis, and the harrier hawk, Sursus Gouldi but it was soon pointed out that it was only the sheep of the alpine country that were attacked while the gulls and hawks scoured the plains as well as the mountains. It was a well-known fact that the gulls would pick at the eyes of a very young lamb, or even of a sheep, when it had fallen, but they had never been known to attack the sheep over the loin in the manner of the unknown culprit. Wild dogs were next suggested, but they were then practically unknown, and the fact that there were never any injuries found on the sheep except those on the loin, went to prove that the sheep could not have been pulled down and worried by dogs. About this time the suggestion that the Kia might be the culprit was strengthened by the fact that the bird had been seen picking the refuse around the meat gallows. Some poisoned mutton was spread out in a likely place, and soon the Kias were observed to come down and devour it so greedily that in a short time their dead bodies were lying around their unfinished meal. 
this experiment gave the clue as to the direction in which investigation must be made in order to solve the mystery. And at once, Mr. Campbell, of Lake Wanaka Station, ordered his men to keep a keen lookout when working in high country. Not long after this, these suspicions were substantiated by the observations of Mr. James MacDonald, at that time head shepherd at Lake Wanaka Station, and now a sheep farmer at Tipton, Southland. Through the kindness of Professor Benham of Dunedin, I am able to give Mr. MacDonald's own description of the first recorded case of sheep killing by Kias. He thus described what he saw. Quote, I do not know whether I was the first to see the Kia attack sheep, but I was the first to report it to Mr. Henry Campbell of Wanaka Station. In 1868, my orders were to go all over the run after the snowfall and see that the sheep were evenly distributed over the ground, that no hill or spur had more sheep on it than it could well carry. While I was at this work, the snow being about two feet deep, I went out to the tops. In a small basin, under the top of the west side, facing a rocky country that we called Skay, there was a mob of sheep snowed in and unable to get out. There I saw the Kia at work. He would come down from the rocks, settle on a sheep's loin, and peck into the sheep, which would run through the mob, but the bird stuck to the sheep all the time, till he got a piece out of it. Then he would fly to the rocks. I watched the bird at this work and did not fully disturb him until I was fully satisfied. Then I went down to the station and reported to Mr. Campbell. He would not credit me, and all hands on the station refused to believe that the birds would do it. So I was ordered to go to another hill, called Black Hill, and Mr. Campbell came with me, and some more men, and at the first mob we came to, Mr. Campbell and the rest saw the key as at work. End quote. It seems to me to be a great pity that the early writers on this question did not take the trouble to get authenticated evidence, for if this had been done, much of the confusion and uncertainty as to the Kia's real habits would have been prevented. However, instead of obtaining the above evidence from Mr. MacDonald, which would at least have recorded the names of two men who had actually seen the Kia killing sheep, most early writers make use of an indefinite extract, which appeared in the Otago Daily Times, an extract which, though correct in itself, was not at all conclusive. It runs as follows. Quote, for the last three years, the sheep belonging to a settler, Mr. Henry Campbell, in the Wanaka district, Otago, appeared affected with what was thought to be a new kind of disease. Neighbors and shepherds were equally unable to account for it, not having seen anything of the kind before. The first appearance of this supposed disease is a patch of raw flesh on the loin of the sheep, about the size of a man's hand. From this, matter continually runs down the side, taking the wool completely off the part it touches, and in many cases death is the result. At last, a shepherd noticed one of the mountain parrots, sticking to a sheep, picking at the sore, and the animal seemed to be unable to get rid of its tormentor. The run holder gave directions to keep watch on the parrots when mustering on the high ground. The result has been that during the present season, when mustering high up on the ranges near the skyline, they saw several of the birds surrounding a sheep, which was freshly bleeding from a small wound over the loin. On other sheep were noticed places where the kia had begun to attack them, small pieces of wool having been picked out, end quote. Though this record casts very grave suspicion on the kia, it does not by any means prove that the kia was the culprit. In the first instance, the bird is stated to have been seen merely picking at a sore on a sheep's back, just as today starlings are commonly seen at the same task. And to say that this proves that the sheep was being killed by the kias is putting more weight on the evidence than it will bear. In the second instance, it is stated that the shepherds saw several kias, quote, surrounding, end quote, notice not attacking nor pecking a wounded sheep. And with the uncertainty which existed at that time as to the true culprit, it might easily have turned out that some other animal had wounded the sheep and the kias had only been attracted by its struggles. This latter account, and not Mr. MacDonald's, was unfortunately the one that was published in standard books on our avifauna, and it has been partly responsible for many years of arguing and disagreement between the sheep owners and scientific men. However, though nearly fifty years have passed since the record was first published, there has not been one thoroughgoing attempt to inquire into the case, and up to the end of 1905, this is the only definite case recorded 
where a man actually saw a kia picking at a live sheep. Of course, many articles have been written, both in magazines and scientific works, but I cannot find one writer who says that he ever saw a kia attack a sheep, nor is the name of any man given who said that he had seen the bird at work. It has been since proved that there were, and are, at the present time, many men who had been eyewitnesses of the bird's depredations, but from the records available in 1905, not one could be found. It seems a great pity that writers should publish on such meager evidence, as though it were an indisputably proved fact, that statement that the kia has not only become carnivorous, but also a bird of prey. I think I am justified in saying that all the literature published up to 1905, stating that the kia was guilty of the crime, had given to the world, as a substantiated fact, a statement that had not been satisfactorily proved. If there is anything that ought to be most conclusively proved, it is a statement of alleged scientific fact. And as long as investigators continue to publish, as true, half-proved theories, only error and confusion can be the result. As might be expected from such unsatisfactory evidence, later investigation does not always uphold the conclusions so hastily reached by early writers. It is rather surprising to find that no one questioned the weight of the evidence until 1905, when Dr. L. Cocaine, the retiring president of the Canterbury Philosophical Institute, while reading a paper, quote, on some little-known country in the Waimakariri district, end quote, made the following statement, quote, I have never seen it, the Kia, attack sheep, nor have I ever met with anyone, shepherd, musterer, or mountain traveler, who has done so. The most that my inquiries have elicited is that sheep are found from time to time with holes in their backs, and that Kias have been seen hovering round sheep. End quote. A very warm discussion followed this rather unexpected statement, for people had begun to believe that there could be no doubt about the matter of the Kia killing sheep. But when they found on inquiry that practically no authentic evidence could be found among the records, they naturally became very skeptical. Dr. Cocaine and his supporters did not, as many people state, say that the Kia was innocent, but that at that time the recorded evidence was quite insufficient to prove the bird's guilt. Let us run through the most conclusive recorded evidence and see on what flimsy and unscientific reasons the bird's guilt has been declared proved. About the year 1871, Mr. T. H. Potts condemned the Kia, but on what appears to be hearsay evidence only. He writes as follows, quote, Through the kind offices of Mr. Robert Wilkin, the writer has been greatly assisted with valuable notes, acquired by sheep farmers, owners of stations, shepherds, etc. Unquote. Unfortunately, he does not state that any of his informants ever saw a Kia at work, or whether the notes were merely the sheep station rumors, of which a bookful could be collected today. I believe fully that many of Mr. Potts's correspondents were eyewitnesses of the Kia's depredations, but in finding the truth we cannot take supposed facts to be authentic evidence. In 1878, the Honorable D. Menzies, in a paper on the Kia, wrote as if certain of the bird's guilt, but he gives no authority for his statement. In a book entitled The History of the Birds of New Zealand, Sir Walter Buller gives a fairly complete description of the bird and its habits, and also an illustration of a kia attacking a sheep, but one searches in vain for the name of the actual eyewitnesses. There is mention made of a shepherd who saw a kia attacking some sheep while he was driving them, but no name was given, and, as nothing is known of the man, the evidence dwindles away to nothing. There is, however, a correct description of the method of the Kia's attack, forwarded to Sir W. Buller by Mr. G. J. Shrimpton, but its writer does not state that he ever saw the bird killing or attacking flocks. In 1884, Reischeck wrote an article on the Kia, but though he saw them eating the carcasses, and also found wool and fat in their crops, he never saw one attack a sheep. Mr. C. C. Huddleston, in 1891, gave an account of his experiences in Kia country, and strongly condemned the bird, but he himself never saw the bird in the act of murdering. In 1894, Mr. Taylor White accused the bird of sheep killing, but yet does not seem to have been an eyewitness. He bases his conclusions on hearsay, for he says, quote, One day my brother John came home and said that he knew 
what caused the holes in the backs of the sheep. It was done by the Kia. This surprised me greatly, but I soon afterwards had evidence of the fact myself. For when some of these birds had once found out that blood of the sheep was good for food, others were initiated into the performance. End quote. What Mr. White or his brother saw is not recorded, and I think that, if a Kia had been seen attacking a sheep, that fact would almost certainly have been included in the paper. I have since had a letter from Mr. T. White, in which he states that he never saw a Kia attack a sheep. In February 1906, at a meeting of rentholders held at Culverden, some strong remarks were made about the loss of sheep caused by the Kia, and the Wellington Philosophical Society was ridiculed for upholding the statement that at the present time the recorded evidence against the Kia was not sufficient to condemn it. However, in spite of all their talk, only one speaker was reported to have seen the Kia attacking sheep. The rest all spoke from hearsay, and I have since received a letter from the reported eyewitness stating that the newspaper had misrepresented his remarks, for he had not said any such thing at the meeting. This meeting was the means of leading many people to believe in the Kia's guilt, and yet, when the evidence there available was sifted, not one man had seen the Kia in the act of attacking. This is the pith of the recorded evidence. Up to the end of 1905, and, in spite of all that has been written on the subject, I was unable to find the name of one writer who said that he had seen the bird attacking sheep. Though the evidence of eyewitnesses was lacking, the circumstantial evidence was very strong and may be classed as follows. 1. Against the Kia. A. The account of the Wanaka shepherds. B. Only where Kias were known to live were the sheep wounded after the Kia's method. Where they were unknown, no instance of this special kind of sheep killing had been seen. C. If sheep had been killed and the birds in that place were shot, the killing at that place ceased. D. Kias had been seen to fly off the bodies of sheep, and wool and fat had been found in their crops. E. Some Kias in captivity would eat meat, fat, skins, etc. At first sight, this evidence seems quite conclusive enough to condemn the Kia, but we must remember that circumstantial evidence can never by itself prove a scientific fact. To see how far we can err from the truth by depending on this kind of proof, we have only to go back to the days of supposed witchcraft and note how an English court of law condemned many people to punishment and death for what it honestly believed to be an undoubted fact. We can see now how the level-headed men of those times came to an absolutely wrong decision because the evidence that seemed so conclusive was merely circumstantial. On the other side, there was also some evidence to show that the Kia might be innocent. This may be classed as follows. 2. For the Kia. A. The lack of records of eyewitnesses. B. In many places where Kia were known to live, no sheep had been killed after the Kia's method. C. Many Kias in captivity would not eat meat, etc. D. Many of the men who accused the bird were paid for exterminating them, and they would naturally wish the story to be believed. Over this circumstantial evidence a war of words has waged for many years, and once or twice it seemed as if the Kia would be exterminated before the question was finally settled. In order to try to bring this important question to a final conclusion, I set to work to collect written statements from actual eyewitnesses who lived or had lived in Kia country, and by carefully sifting and arranging this evidence to obtain the actual facts about this interesting bird. In response to several requests kindly published for me by the newspapers, I have received a large amount of evidence from men who live or have lived in the Kia country, viz., musterers, shepherds, head shepherds, managers of stations, run holders, and station owners. These, it is true, are probably not trained scientific observers. Nevertheless, they all live in contact with facts, and it seems to me that we are sure to get nearer to the truth by taking the experiences of men who have spent most of their lives in Kia country in preference to those of men who judge the birds mostly from caged or preserved specimens. To make the evidence as reliable as possible, the following precautions have been taken. 1. Nothing but the accounts from eyewitnesses themselves has been taken. 2. Evidence without the writer's name and address has been cast out. 3. All details, such as year, have been forthcoming as far as possible, 
in each case. Four, the witnesses, if necessary, have been cross-examined by post. Five, all the accounts of Kia's attacking sheep have been forwarded with a written statement to the effect that, if necessary, the writer will swear to his evidence before a justice of the peace. The result of this investigation has already been published. Footnote. Transactions of the New Zealand Institute, Volume 28, page 271. Including the eyewitnesses' names and addresses, as well as many of their written accounts. I am fully aware that, in spite of all these precautions, inaccuracies may creep in, and I have already proved that some men will even tell lies for the sake of having their names published. However, in order to substantiate the records, I have made several trips into the Kia country and can testify to many of the facts myself. To some people, this question will never be satisfactorily proved until some man of scientific standing has actually seen the Kia killing the sheep. In order to satisfy these doubters, I would suggest that a number of sheep should be fenced in on some station where Kias are plentiful, and that someone of scientific standing should watch. The Kia's method of attack could be witnessed in surroundings that are quite natural, and no forcing or starving of the bird would be needed. However, I think I am justified in saying that, as far as human evidence can be relied on, I have conclusively proved that the Kia has not only taken to meat-eating, but that it does actually attack and kill sheep. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of The Kia, A New Zealand Problem by George Reginald Mariner This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 7 The Sheep Killer In sin and shame o'ertaken thy glory shall sink in gloom. John Liddell Kelly The Kias have several methods of attacking sheep, and it depends largely upon the kind of ground as to which one is used in a particular instance. They may attack in large numbers, up to 120, or merely in ones and twos. Usually one or two old birds, known as, quote, sheep killers, end quote, do the killing, and the others share the spoil. It is quite a mistake to suppose that all kias kill, or even attack sheep, just as we have comparatively harmless tigers, who will not attack man except under provocation, and also man-eaters, who seem to take a special delight in killing men, so among the Kias, many of them never attack sheep, while others, usually old birds, seem to enjoy nothing better. Again, the Kias do not, as many people suppose, choose the lambs or weaklings, but in most cases the choicest of the flocks is killed. The usual mode of attack seems to be as follows. The bird settles on the ground near its quarry and, after hopping about here and there for some time, leaps onto its prey, usually on the rump. If it cannot obtain a firm grip with its claws, the movement of the sheep may cause it to fall. But the kia seems rather to enjoy the sensation, and so tries again, until it has securely perched itself on the sheep's back. Then the murderer begins cruelly to pull out the wool with its powerful beak until it gets down to the flesh. The sheep, which for some time has been moving uneasily about, gives a jump as the beak enters the flesh, and then commences to run wildly about here and there in vain efforts to rid itself of its tormentor. When, however, the poor beast discovers that it cannot dislodge its enemy, it seems to lose its head and rushes blindly about, usually at high speed. Sometimes the birds run the sheep to death, and then gorge themselves on the dead body. At other times they never really reach a vital part of the animal's anatomy, but after severely wounding it, they leave it, and the poor brute wanders about with a large gash, sometimes four or five inches across, on its rump and torn open so much that the transverse processes of the vertebrae can be seen. The sheep struggles along until blood poisoning, caused by filth and exposure, sets in, and the unfortunate beast lies down and gives up the struggle. The animals must suffer very severe torture as they wander about, the large wound exposing the flesh to insects and to extremes of weather. This method of killing accounts for the number of sheep that are found in the paddocks at shearing time, wounded or dead, with nothing but a scar showing on their rumps. While staying at the Mount Algida station, I was fortunate enough to see three sheep that had been attacked in this way by the Kias. On the top flat near the base of the Ralston Range, on a large terrace sloping down to the Matthias River, we found a splendid merino ram lying dead, just where two wire fences met at right angles. 
It looked as if the sheep had been cornered here and wounded. There was an ugly wound on the rump about eleven inches from the base of the tail, the gash measuring four inches by five in width and about two inches deep. One half had been torn down to the sinews, while the lower half was eaten down to the bone. The body cavity, though just pierced, did not seem to have been disturbed. From all appearances the animal had died from blood poisoning and exhaustion, as the wound was very black and dirty. Just near this, belonging to the same mob, we found a live ram running about with the others, with a dirty gash on its rump, in a situation similar to that of the wound in the other animal. The wound was V-shaped, and along the sides it measured four inches by six inches. It had partly healed, but was festering very badly, so that there was little hope for the unfortunate sheep. At Lake Coleridge Station, near the homestead, a four-toothed merino ewe was found wandering about with a large circular wound on its back, somewhat nearer the head than in the former cases. It was put into the yards to await my arrival, but it died before morning. The wound was four inches by three in size, and had just entered the body cavity. When this sheep was skinned, it was seen that the whole back was more or less black, which seemed to point to blood poisoning, as none of the organs were injured. Though the cases cited are horrible enough, the wounds are often more severe, for not only are the kidneys injured, but often the intestines are torn and pulled out through the wound. Sheep have been found with yards of their intestines, all hardened up by exposure to the sun and air, dragging along the ground. In discussing the effects of the horrible cruelties practiced on the sheep by the Kias, Sir W. Buller gives the following account. Quote, on the surgical operation performed on the living sheep by the Kia, an interesting paper was read before the Pathological Society of London in November 1879 by the distinguished surgeon, Mr. John Woods, F.R.S. He exhibited the colon of a sheep in which the operation known as colotomy had been performed by this parrot, of which likewise he produced a specimen, both having been sent to him for that purpose by Dr. de la Tour of Otago. Quote, Mr. Woods was informed by his correspondence that, when the sheep were assembled, wounds resulting from the Kia's vivisection are often found upon them, and not infrequently the victims present an artificial anus, a fistulous opening into the intestines in the right loin. The specimen exhibited was from a sheep that had been so attacked. It consisted of the lumbar vertebrae and the colon, showing the artificial anus between the iliac crest and the last rib on the right side, just in the place, that is, where the modern surgeons perform the operation known to them as amusets. Below the wound, the intestine was contracted, while it was enlarged and hypertrophied above. The sheep was much wasted. The modus operandi was described as follows. The birds, which are very bold and nearly as large as rooks, single out the strongest sheep in the flock. One bird, settling on the sacrum, tears off the wool with its beak and then digs its beak into the flesh until the sheep falls from exhaustion or loss of blood. Sometimes the wound penetrates to the colon, when, if the animal recovers, this artificial anus is formed. It may be on the left, but more frequently is on the right side. It has been suggested that the bird aims at the colon in search of its vegetable contents, but the Kia's carnivorous appetite has been too frequently noticed to necessitate any such hypothesis. End quote. One of my correspondents gives the following account. Quote, One solitary weather I found on the Kingston flat, still alive and standing, with a hole halfway down the right flank and about eighteen inches of the double of his small gut on the ground. I afterwards saw him dead at the same place. End quote. Often the birds seem to delight in prolonging the sheep's misery, for a shepherd writes as follows. Quote, Along with another shepherd, I was out on the ranges attending to the sheep when we heard the kias making a great noise. On looking up to where they were, we saw a sheep standing on a ledge of rocks. One kia kept jumping onto the sheep's back and pecking at him. The sheep was trying to get away, but could not get off the ledge. Evidently, it had been chased by the kias, and it had jumped onto the ledge. The kias were at the sheep for fully half an hour, and we could not get near to drive them off. When we left, the birds were still worrying the sheep. End quote. Another shepherd gives the following account. Quote, I have noticed a wounded sheep standing on steep faces, and the key is walking round and round it. 
the sheep would also keep turning round so as to face its tormentors, butting at them and trying to keep them off. They would keep on until the sheep would lose its footing and would fall to rise no more. End quote. The position and attitude of the bird while on the sheep's back is well described in the following. Quote, it was in the afternoon. I was mustering in Boundary Gully, Mount Cook Station, at the time, and had a mob of sheep in hand, and was about two chains away when a kia, one of several that were flying around, settled on a sheep. The beast at first gave a jump or two, and then made downhill at a great rate. When the sheep got into motion, the bird spread out its wings, and as the pace became faster, the wings came together at the perpendicular. The sheep continued to race until both were lost to view, after going some distance through the storm. End quote. These blind rushes often end even more tragically. The sheep, in its blind rush, often comes to a precipice and, with the same impulse that brought it so far, it leaps over the edge and is dashed to pieces on the ground below. In this case, the kia leaves its hold as soon as the sheep begins to fall, but follows the unfortunate animal in the descent to satisfy its hunger on the result of its labors. Mr. Robert Guthrie of Canterbury, who has spent a large number of years in Kia country, gives the following graphic description of Kia's attacking the sheep at their nightly camps. Quote, at last, one clear night, when there was about half a moon, I made my way up to the sheep camp. After a good deal of trouble, I got into a crevice in a rock that I had selected in daytime, within twenty feet of the nearest sheep, and without disturbing them. I lay there for some hours and, just two or three minutes, before the moon went down, fifteen kias alighted within ten feet of where I was lying, as silent as specters. They immediately became exceedingly active, running about and picking at this and that, amongst the sheep, jumping on and off the sheep's backs, the sheep not taking the slightest notice of them. All at once the moon left me, and I could see no more. I waited for more than an hour longer, and during that time there were a few commotions among the sheep, but not a sound from the kias. I got one dead sheep the next day. The next night I was again in my place in the rocks, and had only a few minutes to wait, when the fifteen kias lit again, as silently as on the night before. They again scattered round the camp, and seemed to be exceedingly busy and active, running to and fro, picking at this and that. It seemed to me that they were after small grubs that are usually found about a sheep camp. They eventually began jumping on the sheep's backs, and sometimes as many as four would be on one sheep at a time. One would give a peck, the sheep would give a bound forward, and they would all come off. They did not seem to follow the same sheep, but just hopped on to the first one they came to. Sometimes when one got on a sheep's back, in a good position, behind the kidneys facing the head, it would keep pecking and so keep the sheep jumping round and through the mob for a long time. I am quite certain that they thoroughly enjoyed the fun of riding on the sheep and falling off. After about an hour of this sport, I noticed one that had got in a good position on a sheep's back, striking it more quickly and more vigorously than any of the others. It kept the sheep careering in and through the camp in an awful state until at last it disappeared down the ridge leading down to some overhanging rocks. After about a minute I heard a kia call far down the gully. Next day I got a dead sheep at the foot of the rocks, where the sheep disappeared. I did not see the kia come back to the camp, but no doubt it did directly the sheep went over the rocks. At any rate, less than twenty minutes afterwards I again saw a kia in the correct position on a sheep's back, viciously striking, and I distinctly saw it lift its head and give one strong peck when the sheep immediately collapsed and fell down among the other sheep. I think the kia then left it. I waited for some time and then went out as quickly as I could. The mob drew out of the camp, but the injured sheep was still sprawling about. I tried to make it stand, but it could not. I came back next day and found it lying in the same place, but black and very much swollen. I cut its throat and left my gun in my hiding place during the day and came back at night. I got six of the fifteen kias that night and the others during the next three weeks. There was never a sheep killed on this camp after the night I saw the sheep struck down. End quote. The case of a sheep jumping over a precipice in its terror is not an altogether uncommon occurrence, as can be seen by the number of marked sheep found dead at the foot of the precipices. Writing on this subject, 
one of my correspondents says, quote, I write to say that I have seen the Kia at work at a sheep. The latter was driven frantic by the bird's attack, and ran wildly in any and every direction, eventually making a bee-line down a steep slope, as if blind, took a header over the precipice, more than a hundred feet high, and was dashed to pieces on the rocky and shingly bottom. The Kia hung on to its prey until the moment the unfortunate animal left terra firma, when the bird relaxed its hold and flew down almost on the very track of its prey when it was lost to view by the writer, and a shepherd who also was there. End quote. Sometimes the sheep tears round the flock, until it's played out and cowed, when it sinks to the ground and lies with its neck stretched out, a picture of misery. At other times, the terrified sheep, as if making a last despairing attempt to get rid of its enemy, rushes madly forward in one direction, usually downhill, at a terrific speed, quite oblivious of rocks and pitfalls the kia, meanwhile, holding on and balancing itself with outstretched wings. Very soon the sheep strikes a rock or stumbles and rolls over and over down the hill, only to get on its feet again and repeat the performance, time after time. When the beast stumbles, the kia rises on its wings and settles down again on the sheep when it has regained its feet. This awful race is continued until, bruised by its numerous falls, utterly exhausted by its death struggles and maddened with pain, the terrified animal stumbles to rise no more and becomes an easy prey to the kia. Several men have witnessed these awful rushes and have also come upon the murderer gorging himself on the live sheep, tearing at the kidney fat and pulling at the entrails. The following are a few instances illustrating this method of attack. Mr. J. Sutherland writes, quote, In 1887 I was keeping a boundary where kias were numerous, and on several occasions I saw them attack sheep. I saw a sheep running down the hill with a kia hanging on. I followed after it and found the sheep lying in the gully with a kia tearing away at it. I drove it off. The sheep was not dead, but the wool and the skin were torn, and a hole was made in the sheep's back, just above the kidney, a wound from which it would have died. However, I killed it to put it out of pain. End quote. Mr. H. E. Cameron gives the following account. Quote, One day while mustering in the summertime, of 1895, I saw a kia on a sheep's back, clinging to the wool and digging its beak into its back, and a number of others flying about. I went down to the sheep with some other men. Some entrails had been pulled through a hole in its back, and we had to kill the sheep. I was camped at the foot of Davy's Saddle, Long Slip Station, one foggy day, and at three o'clock heard a giant screaming of kias, so I went out to see what they were at. On going down the creek a short distance, I saw a sheep coming down the face of the hill as fast as it could, with a kia on its hips and twelve more birds following and screaming. The sheep, when it got to the foot of the hill, ran under a bank and went down on its knees, the kia picking away at its back, and the others watching, as if waiting for a feed. I went up to the sheep after throwing stones at the birds. When I got up to the sheep, it had two holes in its back, and the kidney fat had been eaten but the kidneys were lying bare in the sheep. The entrails were pulled out through the hole in the back. The sheep was not dead, but had to be killed. End quote. Mr. A. S. Smith of Fairley writes, quote, The first occasion on which I actually saw a sheep killed was one time while mustering. I noticed two sheep that had been passed some little distance. And while in the act of hunting a dog for the sheep, a kia flew down to the back of a sheep, which made headlong down the hill, with the bird all the while on its back. After running some little distance, the beast stumbled and fell. Then the bird rose to its wings, and the sheep continued its race downhill, evidently much terrified. The bird then flew onto the sheep's back again while it ran. This occurred, I should say, three or four times, before the bottom of the gully was reached. When I went to investigate, I found the sheep not quite dead, but bleating with evident pain. It would appear on account of a hole in its back, close up to the shoulder, end quote. Mr. H. Heckler of Lumsden writes, quote, I was keeping boundary at the Gladstone Gorge after snow muster and was gathering the stragglers off the high country when I came across about twenty kias. Two of them were on a sheep's back. The balance were flying around him, a stray weather, making a terrible noise. The sheep was going at full speed down the spur. I watched him where he ran to and followed him down for about three miles, when I got down, the sheep was dead, with two holes, 
one on each side of the backbone, in him, and most of the mob of Kias were picking out the kidney fat. I crawled to the rock where the poor sheep was lying, and the Kias were so busy that I killed three of them with my stick. End quote. Mr. Andrew Watherson, writing to me of his experiences in 1904, says, quote, I was looking out a mob of weathers, and found that the Kias had been killing them, and there were eight dead. As it came on a dense fog, I had to return to my hut. Early on the following morning, I went out to the weathers again. Arriving where the sheep were camped some time before sunrise, I could hear the Kias calling, and following up the sound, I got to where there were about forty of them. They had about three or four hundred weathers rounded up. The sheep were huddled close together, and the Kias were flying over them and alighting on their backs. When the Kias started to pick the back of a sheep, it would start to run round and round the mob. The Kia would rise, but as soon as the sheep stopped, the bird was on its back again. This continued for a little time. The sheep, apparently getting sulky, lay down with its neck stretched out and its lower jaw resting flat on the ground, when it showed no further resistance, but allowed the Kia to pick away at its back. I never knew a sheep, after it once sulked, to show any further resistance. I shot nineteen kias and left the mob, but on looking around I found that they had killed thirty-eight weathers, most of them being quite warm and in splendid condition. End quote. Many more such instances could be cited, but enough has been said to show the methods and the results of the kias' attacks on sheep. The greatest damage is done to the flocks in winter. When the country is snowbound, in the mountainous regions the sheep are usually kept down on the low country, until the mountains get a good coat of snow. For once the tops are covered, there is very little danger of the sheep going far in that snow. However, if the sheep have been allowed to remain on the tops of the ranges until the snow comes, as is sometimes the case on a big run, they gather together in a basin near the summit and are buried by the snow. It is at this time that the Kia finds them an easy prey, and many a bloody battlefield the snow being deeply tinged with red, shows where the helpless benumbed sheep have been literally torn to pieces while alive by the relentless birds. Even when men, wading waist-high in the snow, climb up to dig the sheep out, the brutal birds will often not leave their prey, but fall victims to the musterer's alpenstock. Here are some accounts from eyewitnesses. Mr. McIntosh of Lake Tickapo says, quote, I saw again another mob stuck in the snow, in a very rough place, which we shepherds could not get to. I watched from the other side of the gully and, by the aid of my glasses, saw the parrots actually eating the sheep alive while they were caught in the snow. End quote. Mr. Logan, another of my correspondents, says, quote, The sheep were held up by the snow, and there were thirteen kias attacking them. They had some killed, and others maimed beyond recovery. They were sitting on the living and the dead, but only one or two of the birds seemed to be attacking the living. End quote. Mr. Hugh McKenzie writes, quote, In 1884, on Lorne Peak Station, Wakatipu, in the month of July, there came a heavy fall of snow. One morning, early, myself and two other men went out to look up the sheep. At 10 a.m. we sighted a mob. As we got within about a quarter of a mile of them, we could make out a number of kias flying about the sheep, making a great screaming noise. We at once hastened on to the sheep, which were stuck on a point of the spur, about 3,000 feet in altitude. At a distance of three or 400 yards, we saw two sheep floundering in the snow, with a kia perched on the rump of each sheep, and at work on the loins. These sheep would be distant from the mob about 80 yards, and fully 20 yards from each other. As we sighted them, however, notwithstanding our singing out and hurrying up to the sheep, neither kia quitted his position until we were within 20 yards of them. They, however, did not damage the sheep enough to cause death, as we arrived just in time, end quote. The last instance is given by Mr. O'Brien, quote, Three of us were sent to muster the sheep off this spur, where the snow was, according to our judgment, fully three feet deep on the top and deeper in places. On reaching the summit of what we called the main top, we came across a mob of sheep more or less snowed in. These we dug out of the snow, and having let them roll down the hill as far as they would, we went further up the spur to see how many more we could find. After a short climb, we came across a mob of fifty, also snowed in, and here I caught the kias in the act of murdering. The birds had already killed three, and several others were dying. The dead ones were very much torn about, 
and what especially attracted my attention was the way in which the small gut was pulled out through the flank and stretched yards away. There were fully a dozen kias attacking the mob around the hole, and the place was literally stained with blood, no doubt from the kia's blood-stained feet. The birds seemed thoroughly to enjoy killing sheep, and were very bold. I was up to my waist in snow alongside the sheep, and when I was standing still, the kias would come boldly up to me, to within five feet. After we had driven the kias off, they flew almost straight to the first mob, and according to my mates, who went back for the first mob, attacked those sheep in a similar way. End, quote. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of the Kia, a New Zealand Problem by George Reginald Mariner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter Eight: Getting into Bad Habits. I must be free as the wildest thing, free to laugh in the beams of day, free on the blast to be borne away. William Pember Reeves. I am almost certain that too much emphasis has been laid on the fact that the Kia a member of the brush-tongued parrot family, has changed its ordinary diet and taken to eating meat and fat. When we consider the natural diet of the bird, the change seems more or less natural, for there seems to be very little difference between eating a large plump grub and a piece of fat. The more interesting fact is that, in addition to this, it has changed its character and, from being a harmless parrot, has become a bird of prey of no mean order. Other birds in confinement, at all events, have been known to eat meat, though in nature they seem to content themselves with fruit and seeds. For example, many parrots and cockatoos seem thoroughly to enjoy cleaning up bones with particles of flesh on them. Again, in New Zealand, the little white eye, Zosterops cerulescens, whose natural food is bright, small insects and fruit, can be easily trapped, in winter especially, by means of suet fat or meat bones, both of which it devours readily. Therefore, it seems to me that there is nothing very wonderful in the fact that the kia enjoys a little meat and fat in addition to its ordinary food. Another interesting case is that reported by Captain Hendy of British East Africa and forwarded to Nature by Professor E. Ray Lancaster on 10 August 1990. It runs as follows, quote, The common rhinoceros bird, Bufaga erythrorhynca, here formerly fed on ticks and other parasites, which infest game and domestic animals. Occasionally, if an animal had a sore, the bird would probe the sore to such an extent that sometimes it killed the animal. Since the cattle plague destroyed the immense herds in Ukami honey, and nearly all the sheep and goats were eaten during the late famine, the birds, deprived of their food, have become carnivorous, and now any domestic animal, not constantly watched, is killed by them. Perfectly healthy animals have their ears eaten down to the bone, holes torn in their backs, and in the femoral region. End quote. It will thus be seen that at least three kinds of insectivorous and fruit-eating birds are known to eat fat and meat on special occasions. When we look at the circumstances that force the kia to add to its diet, it would have been more wonderful if the bird had refused to touch the new food. Unfortunately for science, as the kia had learned to kill sheep before men were aware of it, we shall never be able now to decide finally what set of circumstances caused him to change. But I think that the truth is confined to the last two of the following three theories. Whether the change of diet was influenced in the way explained by either one or both of those theories, it is hard to say but so far no other reason can be given to which it is worth while giving serious consideration. The Vegetable Sheep Theory This was the earliest, and for many years, the most popular. But when further investigation brought to light many new facts, the theory lost favor, though even today some people adhere to it. The Vegetable Sheep, after which I have named the theory, is one of the most interesting of our alpine plants. Owing to its cushiony appearance, it is often erroneously termed a moss or fungus. The name includes two closely allied plants, which grow especially on the mountainous country of the northern half of the South Island, at an altitude of from 4,000 feet to 6,000 feet above sea level. Dr. L. Cochrane makes the following comment upon them, 
Quote, the rocks of the alpine summits weathering away, and the rain not being sufficient to bear all the debris down into the valleys, an enormous quantity of angular stones collects on the mountain sides in many places, which may form steep slopes for thousands of feet. As the climber wearily ascends these shingle slips, as they are called, progress is slow. The stones continually slip beneath his feet and slide down the slope. No place could seem more unlikely to support vegetable life. It is in truth a veritable alpine desert. On these shingle slips the wonderful vegetable sheep are encountered. These grow, not on the shingle, but on the rocks which the stones have nearly buried. Large examples form great hummocks, six feet long, by three feet across, or even more. Really, they are shrubs of the daisy family, and are provided with a thick, stout, woody main stem, and strong roots, which pass far into the rock crevices. Above, the stems branch again and again, and towards their extremities are covered with small, woolly leaves, packed as tightly as possible. Finally, stems, branches, and leaves are all pressed into a dense, hard convex mass, making an excellent seat for a wearied botanist. Within, the plant is a peat made of its rotting leaves and branches, which holds water like a sponge, and into which the final branchlets put their roots. Thus the plant lives in a great measure on its own decay. End quote. There are two kinds. A finer one, Raulia eximia, which is of a grey-blue colour, is found over many of the mountains in Canterbury, and a coarser kind, Hastia pulvinaris, which is of a yellowish-brown colour, and is confined to the mountains just north of Canterbury. At a distance, a number of these plants do somewhat resemble a few sheep lying down, hence the name. The supporters of the theory hold that the kia was in the habit of tearing open these plants in order to get out the large white grubs, which were said to live in them, and that, when sheep first wandered into the bird's domain, they were mistaken for the woolly vegetable sheep. The bird, with the intention of digging out the grubs, was supposed to tear open the animal's skin, and, finding meat and fat even more appetizing than the grubs, persisted in its efforts, and so acquired the habit of sheep-killing. All this sounds very reasonable, but unfortunately for the theorists, it will not bear investigation. The first objection is that, where the kia was first known to attack sheep, the true vegetable sheep are unknown, and many mosses are just as conspicuous as the species of Raulia that grows around Lake Wanaka. Raulia eximia does not grow farther south than Mount Ida in central Otago. At present, it's only known habitat in that province. Secondly, no large white grubs, big enough to cause the kia to tear up these tough plants, have ever, as far as I can ascertain, been found in such numbers as to attract the birds. And though I have often torn the plants to pieces, I have never found any large insect larvae. Thirdly, if the kia feeds on the grubs that are said to live in these plants, one would expect to find the shrubs partly torn up, but I can find no evidence in favor of this. Though I have been upon the ranges where both the kias and vegetable sheep were numerous, I have always found the plants intact. Lastly, when the kia first attacked sheep, according to the first accounts, the shoulder or the rump, the latter in preference, was the part chosen. Now, if the bird were in the first instance looking for grubs, he would almost be certain to have worked right along the back, but the evidence disproves this. It therefore seems to me that, unless some very strong new evidence is forthcoming in support of this theory, we have no alternative but to leave it, in future, out of consideration. The Curiosity Theory The supporters of this theory say that it has been nothing but the key is insatiable curiosity and love of investigation that has got it into the habit of sheep-killing. As has been shown in a previous chapter, it is never happier than when it is pulling something to pieces and anything with a strange appearance is always a temptation too strong for the kia to resist. Now, the suggestion embodied in the theory is this, that when a sheep first wandered into the kia's domain, as the bird had very likely never before in its life seen anything that walked on four legs, this woolly animal at once aroused its curiosity. With the kia, to wish to investigate is to do it, and the sheep became a center of attraction. The bird would no doubt walk round these strange animals and inspect them from all sides, and when satisfied with the view from the ground, it would fly onto the sheep's back. This would naturally cause the sheep to move, and the kia would soon tumble off, no doubt thoroughly enjoying the novelty. In this way, by repeated failures, the bird would soon acquire the neck 
of holding on to a sheep while it was running. Once on the back of a sheep, the bird would now want some other novelty to amuse itself with, and the woolly fleece would become the next object of investigation. Soon the flesh and fat would be reached, and the bird finding these new morsels much to its taste, the art of sheep killing would soon be acquired. In this country, the heavy snowstorms often bury, or practically bury, many sheep. The struggles of a half-buried beast would soon attract the kia, and finding the animal an easy prey, it would soon begin its depredations. This theory has something in its favor, and no doubt does to some extent account for the bird's change of character. The hunger theory. This one appears to me to explain to a large extent the cause of the kia's downfall, and as food is a necessity, the fall was somewhat natural. There is a good deal of evidence to show that lack of ordinary food greatly influenced the kia towards sheep killing. As the kia feeds on berries, grubs, roots, etc., there is no doubt that in winter and spring, the excessive snow and heavy frost, so prevalent in kia country, must often make the procuring of food very difficult. Again, as at this period the eggs are sometimes laid, and perhaps the young ones have to be fed, the lack of ordinary food must at times make the bird desperate. If this did not, in the first instance, cause the parrot to kill sheep, it seems now to affect the number killed. For usually a severe winter, accompanied by heavy snowfalls, means a heavy death toll levied on the flocks by kias. The pastoral homesteads are scattered in the valleys of the foothills. The kia, wandering about in quest of something to satisfy its intense hunger, would, on reaching the lower levels, come across the meat gallows, where very likely the carcass of a sheep would hang, or at least some skins with pieces of meat and fat, still adhering to them, would be thrown over the fence to dry. In trying everything with its powerful beak to see if it were edible, it would soon taste the pieces on the skins or even from the carcass itself, and finding them much to his taste and easily procurable, it would soon acquire a liking for them. If the skins and carcass were absent, there would always be a number of sheep's heads scattered around the gallows, and the kias could there always find something to eat. It is said that, in the early days, miners prospecting for gold often killed a sheep for food and, roughly skinning it, would leave the skin and much offal on the ground, thus giving the kia ample opportunity to get the taste for meat. Once having acquired the carnivorous taste, it would soon find out that the dead sheep lying about the station contained the same kind of food, and that by tearing off the wool a good meal was always to be had. Tearing at the half-dead sheep, buried in the snow, would be its next step on the downward course, and, finding a lack of dead sheep, it would soon begin to attempt to eat the animal while it was running about. The wounds thus caused would soon mortify and cause the animal's death, and so the key would find a never accessible method of acquiring a meal. Some early writers suggest that, as the bird formerly fed on insect larvae, the finding of a dead sheep in an advanced stage of decomposition gave them the taste for meat. In this way, the carcasses being often full of maggots from the eggs of the ever-present blowfly, as the kia picked out the maggots, it would, at the same time, eat pieces of meat, and so acquire the taste for flesh. This may in some measure have influenced the bird, at any rate. It would largely account for some kias being fond of bad meat. The following information, forwarded by Mr. James MacDonald, adds weight to the hunger theory, especially as the killing first began on the station of which he speaks. In a letter to me, he says, quote, I would like to say one thing, in answer to the question why the Wanaka station suffered first by the Kia. My opinion is that it was because this station was the first to send men out to the outhuts in winter, where they had to kill their own mutton. The skin was hung up on a fence or a bush, and the birds, driven to lower levels by the heavy snow which covered everything, came down in numbers to pick at the skins and entrails. When deprived of this, they began to kill sheep for themselves, after having acquired the taste from the food obtained at the huts. What particular group facts, covered by the hunger theory, really caused the kia to change, I do not know, but I think that this theory indicates in what direction the true cause may be found. End of chapter 8《Chapter Nine of the Kia: A New Zealand Problem by George Reginald Mariner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter Nine: The Kidney Theory. 
how her o'er the fascinating features flits the genuine passions of the nether pit. Alfred Domit. One of the most popular, yet, as I think, erroneous, statements about the Kia is that the bird chooses the part of the sheep where the kidneys are situated and then, burrowing into the living animal, by means of its powerful mandibles, devours this delicacy. Nearly every writer on the subject repeats the statement, and some even quote it as proof of the Kia's intelligence. In his History of the Birds, Sir W. Buller quotes a letter from Mr. W. Chamberlain of Harborne Hall, Birmingham, who cited this statement as an indication of the parrot's reasoning powers. He says, quote, Consider for a moment the sequence of events and the extraordinary change of habit attributed to the parrot. Between 1865 and 1870, the Kia first comes in contact with the shepherd and commences to steal his meat, with a marked preference for the kidneys. This is natural enough, and any other parrot with a tendency to animal food might do the same, and here the matter would ordinarily rest. The shepherds would protect their meat, and the parrots would return to their natural food. Not so with the Kias. Between five and six years later, they found not only that kidneys are somewhere inside living sheep, but whereabouts and the nearest point on the back from which to reach them. End quote. Mr. Chamberlain is quite right in his statements of the fact, but I think that his deductions are far from correct. Dr. Alfred Russell Wallace quotes a similar misstatement in his book called Darwinism, for after describing the methods of the Kia's attack, he says, quote, Since then it is stated that the bird actually burrows into the living sheep, eating its way down to the kidney, which forms its special delicacy, end quote. These incorrect statements were made possible by the loose way in which some of our writers have collected their evidence, and, in some cases, have made use of mere sheep station rumors. It was Mr. C. C. Huddleston who first disputed this statement and said that the Kia attacked sheep for the kidney fat and the flesh. This idea of Mr. Huddleston's is supported by the evidence sent to me by men who have seen many sheep killed and wounded by the Kia, for they all, with one exception, state that the kidney is not the special attraction, but that the meat and fat are the object of the bird's desire. The witness who was the one exception in another part of his letter writes as follows, quote, I have shot many Kias by dead sheep, and they vomit fat, end quote. So there seems to be evidence, even in this exception, that the bird ate the fat rather than the kidneys. Of course, the Kia's taste may have changed since its first attempt at sheep killing, yet many witnesses ranging back to some of the earliest do not support the kidney theory. A shepherd, in a letter to me, says, quote, I have not examined many sheep that have been killed by Kias, but in the ones that I have investigated I have always found the same result, the fat eaten and the kidneys left. Of course, the kidneys have been found mold, but they were not sufficiently torn to give the impression that the Kias had been eating them. End quote. Another correspondent says, quote, I was walking quietly along and came to the edge of a slight depression in the ground, and there, right at my feet, a Kia rose from the body of a sheep. I examined the sheep. It was a fat merino weather, perfectly sound, but it had been severely injured by the Kia. A hole had been made in the sheep's loin. The kidneys were protruding, and some of the fat had been eaten. End quote. Other correspondents write in a similar strain, stating that the kidneys were usually untouched and the fat eaten. If the kidneys were the special delicacy, as Darwinism states, then the Kias, I am certain, would have devoured them as soon as they were exposed. Whatever may have been the attraction in the early days, the Kia does not now kill sheep for the sake of the kidneys. People have been led to suppose that the Kia always went for the kidney, because it always attacked the sheep just over these organs. But after having gone through the accounts of about 50 eyewitnesses, I cannot find any trustworthy evidence in support of the kidney theory. Without crediting the Kia with any special powers of reasoning, there are several better reasons that easily explain its procedure. And these show that the bird simply attacks in the easiest, most natural, and most efficient way. It is, I think, too much to assume that the Kia has inherited from its parents the knowledge as to where the sheep's kidneys are situated, and yet, from the first, the rump has been the favorite part of the attack. The shoulders are injured sometimes, but this is only in the case of sheep buried in the snow. Even if we assume that the Kia has intelligence enough to discover the position of the kidneys, we are still left with a difficulty. We are asked to believe that, 
within the last fifty years, or even a much shorter period, the acquired character of being able to locate the sheep's kidneys has become an inherited character and has passed on to the offspring. In believing this, we accept as a basis for argument that which is a matter for keen controversy among our leading biologists, and is by no means decided. No good case can be built on such insecure foundation. We must look in some other direction for an explanation of the Kia's habit. If we look at the facts, we shall see that the Kia injures the loin, not because the kidneys are there, but because it is the easiest, and in some cases, the only possible point of attack. Nearly all my correspondents say that, from what they have seen, the Kia, with few exceptions, always settles on the sheep's hindquarters. The first reason for this is that the rump is the widest and most solid part of the sheep's back, and so forms a firm platform for the bird to alight on. Some eyewitnesses say that it is the only place where a kia can retain its hold on a sheep. One states, quote, It is almost impossible for a kia to stick on a sheep's back, while pecking it, in any other position than behind the kidneys facing the head. I have seen them trying to hang on to the sheep's back, but unless they were in the position described, they could not stay on for ten yards. End quote. A musterer, writing to me concerning kias that had worried some sheep in a sheep camp, says, quote, they did not seem to follow the same sheep, but just hopped on to the first one they came to. Sometimes, when one got on a sheep's back in a good position, behind the kidneys facing the head, it would keep pecking and would keep the sheep jumping round and through the mob for a long time. End quote. Secondly, when the kia flies after a sheep, the rump is the nearest and handiest part to settle on, and, as the sheep often stumbles and throws the bird off, it will often have to regain its seat while the poor beast is running so it is no wonder that this part is nearly always selected. Thirdly, when the kia is once perched on the sheep's back, it will naturally begin to peck at the handiest part, and this is certainly the loin. Fortunately for the bird, that part is the least protected portion of the whole sheep, for the loins are the only places where the internal organs are unprotected by ribs or other bone. Thus the bird can easily tear its way into the body cavity. There seems to be very little doubt that the preceding reasons do more to determine the kia's point of attack than the presence of the kidneys or kidney fat. Though the bird is fond of the kidney fat, I do not consider that there is enough evidence to show that this part of the beast is the main attraction. It is supported by the fact that many cases are known of sheep killing where the fat is untouched. In July 1907, I saw several sheep which had undoubtedly been killed by the kia and though the muscles along the backbone had been torn off, the kidney fat was untouched. The birds appear in many cases to eat whatever part comes first. Starting at the skin, they eat through the flesh, then on to the fat. Often the fat is only partially eaten, while the intestines have been pulled out and may be found dragging for some distance on the ground. A correspondent states that one day he came suddenly upon two or three kias pecking at the loin of what he supposed was a dead sheep. There was a hole in the sheep's back, and the birds were putting their heads right through to the inside of the animal and pulling out portions of the intestines. He went over and, to his surprise, found that the sheep was not dead. He killed it to put it out of pain. It seems that the birds do not mind what part they eat when they are hungry, so long as they obtain a meal. Mr. Ewan Cameron of Otago gives the following instance. Quote, a snowslip carried some sheep with it, and I found a sheep stuck in the snow, where it had landed, still alive, with its legs eaten to the bone, and half a dozen kias tearing away at him. End quote. The evidence that has been received up to date definitely proves that the kia does not kill the sheep for the sake of the kidneys only, and I doubt very much if they are in any way the source of attraction. As for the kidney fat being the coveted delicacy, there is some evidence to support it, but there is good reason to believe that mechanical reasons, and not physiological ones, determine the point of attack. The case of the kia is certainly unique, in the fact that an insectivorous and fruit-eating parrot should develop the characteristics of a bird of prey. But when we understand the reasons that led the bird to change its habit, much of the wonder ceases. The stout grasping feet, made for holding on to rocks and trees, were naturally fitted for holding on to a sheep's back, and the powerful beak, used for grubbing in the earth or tearing off the bark of trees, was admirably fitted for tearing off the flesh of sheep. Therefore, being as it were naturally adapted for such attack, it is not so very strange 
that the Kia, having been forced into a new way of procuring food, soon developed into a bird of prey. There is an interesting point mentioned by Professor Benham in a paper on the Kia, published in the Transactions of the New Zealand Institute, 1906. Quoting from a correspondence paper, he says, quote, There is another matter I would like to point out to you about Kias. When they have eaten all the flesh off the bone, then they tackle the shoulder, i.e. humerus, and leg bone, and take all the marrow out of them by chipping them with their beaks until they obtain an entrance. I am sending you four shoulder bones, some old and some fresh ones, killed last year. End quote. Professor Benham kindly gave me one of the bones, which I have here figured, and also lent me the correspondence letter. I wrote letters to those men who might be able to give me information on this point, and even went so far as to ask for evidence through the newspapers, which circulate through the Kia country, but I received nothing to support the suggestion made in the letter. In order to ascertain on what statement the authority was made, I wrote to the correspondent and asked him to let me know if he had ever seen the Kias breaking the bones, and also if he could furnish the names of men who could give me authentic evidence on this very interesting point. But I received no answer. Nowhere else in all the Kia country did I hear of any similar instance of bone splitting by Kias, and therefore, until more conclusive evidence is forthcoming, the matter must be regarded as a supposition merely. I cannot trace any teeth marks on the bone, as the Kia has been known to split thin flakes from the soft rocks. It may, by commencing at the head of the bone, which is somewhat soft, be able to split a bone open. It is certain from the appearance of the bone that some animal has split it open, but from the evidence to hand we cannot be sure that this was the work of the Kia. End of chapter 9《Chapter X of the Kia A New Zealand Problem by George Reginald Mariner This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter X Time of Attack Oh, the dew of darkling mornings on the grasses green and grey. Oh, the flush before the saffron and the blushes of the snow. Dark rotus stalking down the gorge awaiting for the day to the sheen of rippling waters in the shingle sweep below. M. C. Keen. Winter and early spring are the periods of the year when the Kias are most aggressive in their attacks on sheep, and this fact seems to intimate that the lack of ordinary food does much to instigate the attacks, for a heavy winter generally means a heavy loss of sheep, apart from accidental losses. This season in the Kia country is usually a very severe one, so much so that some of the other birds make for the plains until the warmer weather returns. Owing to the high altitude, the cold becomes so intense that the ground is frozen hard for long periods, especially on the shady side of the mountains. These parts, for many weeks or even months, are as hard as iron, the birds being thus prevented from obtaining the insect larvae which may be concealed under the ground. The Kias must find it very difficult, in severe seasons, to obtain much vegetable food, and this very probably, as we have seen, drives them to satisfy their craving by killing and feeding on sheep. That very little insect food is obtainable at this season, in some parts, can be seen from the fact that, when at the Mount Algida station in July 1907, though I spent nearly a whole day in searching in the frozen ground for larvae, etc., that I thought the Kia might fancy, hunting in all likely situations, both in the forest and the mountainside, I found only a very meager supply. Not only is food scarce in winter, but the sheep are easier to kill, for the heavy snowstorms which cover the country bury or half bury a large number of sheep, and as they are in many cases unable to move, they become an easy prey to the hungry birds. In early spring, the climatic conditions are, if anything, intensified, and ordinary food is still scarce. To add to this, the kia often nests at this time, and the work of feeding his family makes him very bold and daring. During the late spring and early summer, the ordinary food is more plentiful, the birds kill fewer sheep, and they do not become a menace again until the middle of the summer. The summer trouble may be accounted for by the fact that at this season most of the snow on the lower slopes has been melted, and the sheep, keeping to their usual habit of making for the skyline, 
soon find themselves among the Kias. The bird's opportunity is intensified by the fact that every night the sheep return when possible to particular places on the mountainside to sleep. These are termed camps, and here the murderers are sure of finding a large supply of animals on which to experiment. Their attacks, however, are not altogether confined to any special time, for they have been known to attack sheep at all seasons of the year. Still, from what I can gather, autumn seems to be the time of fewest attacks. No doubt, the plentiful food supply, and perhaps the fact that the sheep have been shorn, thus giving the birds a poor hold on the animals' backs, account for this. All my correspondents agree that the favorable times of day for the bird to commit his depredations are the early morning and the evening. For like its cousin the kaka, whether killing sheep or not, it is always lively at these times. For this reason it is difficult to obtain photographs of the birds actually attacking sheep, for the lack of light and the absence of the shepherd at these times makes the chance of obtaining a snapshot extremely small. They have been known to attack at all hours of the day, but they seem to confine most of the work to the early or late hours. When attacking in the middle of the day, it is nearly always in dull or foggy weather, though rare cases are known of their killing sheep, even in bright sunshine. End of chapter 10「Eleven of the Kia, a New Zealand Problem by George Reginald Mariner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter Eleven: The Damage Done. I, in this realm of seeming rest, what sights you meet, and sounds of dread, Alfred Domit. It is no wonder that in the early days people came to look upon the Kia as a terrible menace to the sheep farming industry of New Zealand for some of the stories told and published about its depredations are enough to stop any sheep farmer from settling in the country. Not only did the man on the sheep station put down most of the animal loss among the flocks to the unfortunate bird, but several standard books published such exaggerated and false stories that one can only wonder how they were ever credited. Unfortunately, these idle tales are still believed, and are quoted in other parts of the world against the Kia. Here are some of the worst. The late Mr. Potts, in his book, Out in the Open, says, On one outlying portion of a lake run, the birds were so destructive that, although there were 30,000 acres of good grassland, the occupiers decided not to place stock upon it. The losses had been so great that it was found better to abandon the country. End quote. The late Sir W. Buller, in his History of New Zealand Birds, says, quote, In some parts of the country the Kia menace has risen to such a pitch that the run-holders have been fairly driven off the country. End quote. He also publishes the following newspaper report. Quote, Mr. D. A. Cameron, one of our oldest run-holders in the lake country Otago, is throwing up his run at Nokomai, through the Kias, which, if not more numerous, are according to report becoming greater adepts at the destruction of sheep. End quote. From these reports one can naturally fill in the sad details. One can see vast stretches of good sheep country, left to the ravages of the hare and the nor'wester, and where flocks of sheep once fed and flourished, a great loneliness reigns. In the valleys, the empty homesteads and the lonely back huts show how far man once penetrated into the fastnesses, ere the flying terror, decimating his flocks, drove him, with the remnants of his fortune, from that plague-infested region. Such would be the idea given to the reader from perusing these accounts. Yet... When we look into the question, nine-tenths of the stories seem to be absolutely false. At any rate, not a piece of evidence can be found today in support of these wild tales. In order to test for myself the truth of these statements, made by early writers, I asked for information through the newspapers that circulate in the very country mentioned by them. By this method, and by writing personally, the following replies have been received. Mr. W. E. Stevens, MRCS, FRCP. Kurau says, quote, I know nothing about the throwing up of the Nokomai run through the depredations of the Kia in 1880 or of any runs about the Cold Lakes district. End quote. Mr. W. Robinson says, quote, I have to inform you that Mr. D. A. Cameron is still the lessee of the run in question, and whilst writing, I can see his stock from my window. End quote. Mr. Alex Elliott from Kinloch Bay, Elgin, 
adds his testimony, saying, quote, I am sure that Mr. Buller made a great mistake when stating that Mr. D.A. Cameron of the Nokomai surrendered his run through the Kias. I know the Nokomai very well, and also Mr. Cameron, and can safely say that the Kia was never any trouble there. End quote. Finally, in order to satisfy myself thoroughly, I wrote to Mr. D.A. Cameron himself, and received the following reply. Nokomai, 24th June, 1907. Quote, Dear Sir, My son Alec has handed me your letter of the 19th inst, re, quote, Kia, end quote. There is no truth in the statement that I ever intended to give up my run, owing to excessive damage done by Kias. Many years ago, we had a few here, but they did not do much damage to the sheep but on the close burn run on Lake Wakatipu, they were very troublesome. I have been informed that the Lake County paid 2S6D each, when they were at their worst, in order to destroy them. Of late years, they have not been troublesome on that run either. I have no idea where Mr. Buller and the papers got their information. Yours truly signed, D.A. Cameron. End quote. Apart from these erroneous published reports, it is almost impossible to get any true estimate of the annual losses, owing to the nature of the country, and the uncertainty of the reports sent in. The country is so vast and mountainous, and the sheep are only mustered at such long intervals, that when the animal loss is estimated, it is impossible to know what percentage must be debited against the Kia. There is always a large annual loss, due to roughness of the country, this causing many sheep to be killed by their falling over cliffs, or being buried in the snow. The damage done by the nefarious birds is sometimes very serious, and often large numbers of dead sheep, showing the Kia scar, testify to the seriousness of the menace. However, very rash statements are made by many writers and musterers, and it is never clear whether the percentage is on one flock, one run, or the whole Kia-infested country. Again, one is never certain whether the killing was continued throughout the year or confined to one occasion and consequently many erroneous and often exaggerated statistics have been quoted from time to time. If the Kia killed sheep all through the year, at the rate it does on certain occasions, or if the Kias in all parts of the Kia country were equally troublesome, then the loss would be so severe that sheep owners would be afraid of stalking that part of the country with sheep. Fortunately, however, this is not the case, for the Kias seem to kill at uncertain intervals, and, after a big slaughter of the sheep, Weeks and months may pass before they again begin their depredations. Yet again, they usually confine their attacks to certain localities, and when the birds there are shot, the killing may cease for years, if not altogether. Some shepherds put the annual loss in the Ikea country at 30 or 40 percent, but from what I can ascertain, this is an exaggeration, for if this percentage were killed annually, there would soon be no sheep left in the Kia infested area. Sometimes, at special places, the killing may be so severe that it becomes a very serious menace to the sheep farmers, as can be seen from the following instances. A musterer writes, quote, I put a mob of sheep off the flat, onto the hills at Makaroa Station, and, on going up the spur two days afterwards, to where the sheep had encamped, I found six dead, end quote. Another gives the following, quote, On Minaret Station I remember a mob of almost 1,300 hoggets being put on a spur, and we only mustered 700 off it. The key is no doubt were responsible for a large number of them. End quote. Three more must suffice. One year I had a bad muster. 400 woolly sheep came in at the beginning of winter, when the snow fell and the sheep could not get away. I placed them, as I thought, in a safe position, on the hillside quite close to where I lived. In spring, when I went to have a look at them, the Kias had killed about 200 of them. End quote. A shepherd, on going to his flock, which he had left the night before, says, quote, I shot nineteen kias, and on looking round, I found that they had killed thirty-eight sheep during the night. Most of them that I found were warm and in splendid condition. The flock consisted of sixteen hundred sheep, and during the winter the kias killed three hundred out of that number, and, as there were a good many birds about, we shifted the sheep, end quote. A runholder wrote to me in 1907, quote, no later than last week, we came on sixty valuable ewes killed by them. One of my shepherds, Watherson, who has communicated with you on this subject, came on eight kias, killing a ewe. The ewe was still living, and the lamb was torn out 
through her ribs. He succeeded in shooting all the birds. End quote. There seems very little doubt that in many instances the birds must kill either for sport or in order to have a number of dead sheep to feed on for some time, for often many are killed and are left almost untouched. It seems as if the birds get a murderous frenzy and do a lot of damage before their thirst for slaughter is satiated. Reckoning over the whole Kia country, I am certain that 5% of the flocks would well cover the annual loss due to Kias. Of course, in some runs at certain times, this number is very much exceeded, but taking the evidence from all sides, I think that this percentage is near the mark. End of chapter 11. Chapter 12 of The Kia, A New Zealand Problem by George Reginald Mariner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 12. Kia Hunting. The speargrass crackles under the billy, and overhead is the winter sun. There's snow on the hills, there's frost in the gully. That minds me of things that I've seen and done. I mind the time when the snow was drifting, and Billy and me was out for the night. We lay in the lee of a rock and waited, hungry and cold, for the morning light. David McKee Wright. When it was discovered that the Kia was probably responsible for the annual loss of a large number of sheep, men at once set to work to try to exterminate him. Incited by the sheep owner and encouraged by the government, an organized massacre was begun and has continued during the last 40 years, resulting in the slaughter of thousands of these interesting birds. At first, nearly every shepherd and musterer carried firearms, and while going about their work, they lost no opportunity of shooting any kias that came within gunshot. The half-crown per head given by the sheep owner did much to stimulate the shooting. When, however, owing to being much hunted, the kia became difficult to approach, the men were unable to afford the necessary time to stalk the bird, and other means of keeping down the pest had to be adopted. The station owners then employed men whose sole duty was to kill kias and rabbits. The position was no sinecure, for only the strong, agile, and fearless could undertake the work. The hunters were usually supplied with firearms, ammunition, food, horses, etc., and besides receiving a weekly wage, they were paid so much per head for all Kia's shot. In order to give a graphic idea of the ordinary routine of a Kia hunter's life, I cannot do better than quote from a letter from Mr. J. S. Ryan, who for many years hunted this mountain parrot, around Mount White, Canterbury. He writes as follows, quote, To hunt the Kia for pleasure or profit is an undertaking that only those who are sound in wind and limb can indulge with safety. It is not for the untrained plainsmen or the tired Tims, who would most probably take more time thinking how to get to the mountain top than they would spend in climbing there. Kia hunting is mostly combined with rabbiting, since one could hardly hunt Kia from day to day throughout the year without a spell. Rabbiting between whiles on the lowlands affords the necessary change. The usual thing is a weekly wage, and so much per head for kias, free tucker, footnote, food, end of footnote, for self and dogs, a pack horse, a riding horse, camping outfit, consisting of tent, billy, footnote, a tin can for boiling water, end of footnote, knife and fork, tomahawk, and piece of wire for grid bread and flour, currants for duff, footnote, pudding, end of footnote, on wet days, butter, if there is any, with as much mutton and potatoes as you care to pack up. To these you add the weekly sporting paper and magazines. A good appetite between meals comes of its own accord. You may start out back, say, on Monday morning, after coming in for supplies. You have a fair day's ride out to the outback hut, where you pull up for the night. Hobble the horses, and sleep like a top, after the usual good tea of chops, potatoes, and billy tea. Next morning you leave half your supplies at the hut, load up the pack horse with the remainder, and then start on your way again. Now comes the river, which you cross continually, as you work your way up to its source in the same gorge, until you reach the very heart of the mountains, and the towering rocky walls close in on you on either side. It is here that the shrill whistle of the blue mountain duck strikes on your ear through the rush and roar of the river 
as it twists and leaps among the boulders and dashes its spray onto the bush that comes right down to the water's edge. You now look out for the best camping ground you can find. Having found a place that suits you, you hobble the horses, after taking them back to the last bit of good feed you passed, pitch your camp, tie up, and feed the dogs, break barch twigs for a bed, get supper, read for a while before lights out, and then sleep. And how you sleep among the mountains after a long day's ride or climb. Now you are in the very heart of the Kia country, and perhaps you rouse up to hear the dogs barking and the Kias singing out overhead. Or you have been dreaming that you are on your way back to the station with the pack horse loaded up with Kia's heads and your fortune made, and you wake to find a dog loose among the tucker. In either case, it's time to get up and get a move on if you are to be among the Kias before they camp for the day. Having breakfasted on the inevitable chops, you pack your lunch for the day's hunting, the said lunch consisting of more chops, cold, slice of bread and butter, and a chunk, footnote, piece, close footnote, of brownie, footnote, a kind of currant loaf, and a footnote, and tea and sugar, for you always take the billy with you. Cartridges and a light single-barreled gun, slung over the shoulder, finish your equipment. You put out the fire, unloose a dog, see that the others are all right, and give them a parting word and pat. Grip your stick, on which your life may depend, in ticklish places. And off you go for two or three hours, climb to the top, just as dawn is beginning to show in the east, and there is still hardly light to enable you to pick your way among the boulders and fallen timber. The reason you always take a dog with you in key hunting is that if you should have the ill luck to break your neck, the dog in time will, owing to hunger, find his way back to the homestead, and thus give silent notice that something has happened to his master. Then the search parties go out. Nip, my favorite spaniel, could spot a kia on the wing long before I could. When the birds are flying far overhead, they will call out, Kio, with a last O long and drawn out. When Nip heard this characteristic note, up would go his head, and he would almost stand on his hind legs. To see him hunt for that kia in the sky was laughable indeed. I could tell when he found the bird by his intense gaze, and by the beating of his stumpy tail on the ground. Then I would whistle to the kia, and unsling my gun, telling Nip to watch the kia as it circled round and dived down. The old dog has fallen backwards many a time, so intent was he on keeping the kia in sight. Down would come the bird, well within gunshot. I've had to walk away, so that I should not blow one to pieces. When one is paid for killing the birds, and five shillings depend on the shot, you do not give the bird a sporting chance by firing at it on the wing. In hunting the kia, you must be up on the mountain top about daylight to catch the birds going home after their night's carouse. The kia, however, will be out feeding and courting all day and all night as well. I have killed them at all hours from the first streak of dawn to the last faint glimmer of daylight. The best time, however, is either in the evening or the morning, when they are going to their feeding grounds or leaving them. They mostly go in pairs in the brooding season. Then, when the young are able to fly about, they travel for a while in families, and afterwards, towards the winter, they club together. I once counted over thirty in a mob, but alas, through having been among the rabbits, my ammunition had almost run out, and I only got nine out of them. The Kia is, I am confident, the most inquisitive bird alive. One may be just visible as a speck in the sky, but if it has no important engagement on hand, a whistle will often bring it down to see you at once. It was my habit when shooting kias to pick off the outsiders or timid ones first, if there were more than two. I always took two at a time. At the report from the gun, the others would give a nervous start, erect a few feathers that do duty for a top knot, and look at me as much as to say, what the dickens was that noise? You may go for days without seeing a single bird, for kia hunting is rather a lottery. But I would keep going where they had been seen at the sheep, and I was bound to get them in the long run. The kia hunter's life is not all beer and skittles. Still, with all the hardships through getting caught in fog or snow on the tops, and so forth, there is something fascinating about it. When once you have got a taste of the free life, fresh air, and sunshine of a kind, which is found amongst the mountains only. You can never forget it, and at times the longing to climb once again is almost irresistible. 
end quote. As Kia hunting is taken up by men all over the Kia country, and each man has to find out the most successful method of killing the birds, there were, and are, many different ways employed. The commonest method is by shooting them with a shotgun, and as the birds are extremely tame and inquisitive, it is not usually very difficult to get near them once they are in view. Several devices are employed to entice the birds within range, and one which is very successful is the using of a decoy. A tame kia is chained to a rock, and his noisy, excited cries soon attract other kias that are in the vicinity. As these appear, they are shot by the kia hunter, who is hidden behind a rock. An extension of this device is to get two kias in separate cages, and to place them so that they cannot see one another, yet near enough to hear each other's cries. This causes them to make a great fuss in trying to attract each other, and is generally successful in bringing down a lot of their wild mates. One man I knew used to take a square yard of scarlet cloth, which he carefully spread out over a rock, placing stones on it to prevent the wind from carrying it away. The vivid color can be seen a long distance away, in contrast to the somber coloring of the mountainside, and the kia sighting it, heedless of the hidden danger, fly down to satisfy their curiosity, and so become spoil for the hunter's gun. Some men have learned to imitate the kia's peculiar call, and this seldom fails to add heads to the heap already obtained. When a number of kias is present and the kia hunter has no more cartridges, the following trick is sometimes resorted to. While in full sight of the birds, he walks behind an overhanging ledge of rock and remains quiet. The kias, who have been watching his every movement, are almost overwhelmed with a longing to know where he has vanished. They fly onto the rock and have a somewhat animated discussion as to the reason of his disappearance. Finally, one bird walks to the edge and peeps over at him, as much as to say, what on earth are you doing there? This is the key hunter's chance. There is a swift blow from his stick, and the key topples over. The other birds, seeing that number one has not come back to report, but has also disappeared over that mysterious ledge, likewise go to inspect. And often quite a number are killed in this strange way. The second general method is to shoot the birds while they are feeding on the remains of a sheep. The men take the bearings of some sheep that has been killed, and if they cannot find a carcass, they sometimes kill a beast and then camp near it at night. Moonlight nights are generally chosen, so that the birds can be seen at the body, and usually a number of kias fly down from the surrounding peaks and begin to gorge themselves. The men do not shoot them at once, but wait until the birds have stuffed themselves with meat and fat. Then they are shot one after the other, for they are too lazy and full to hasten away. One correspondent gives the following account, quote, at Makaroa Station in spring, I was shooting kias pretty well every night, when I carried a gun. I would hunt about for dead carcasses. If I came on a freshly killed sheep, or one partially eaten, I was always sure of a good haul. I would wait about until the kias came. Sometimes they would arrive in mobs, at other times in a straggling way. I would then take up my position, a little distance off the meat, and wait until they got on to it to feed. My object was to line them so as to get as many as I could at one shot. Though they would fly off at each shot, they would be back again almost immediately. I would keep at them in this way, until they got a little frightened. Then I would follow them up and shoot them as I could. I think the largest that I ever got in that way was 63, off two dead sheep. I have at other times got from 20 to 50, but often I would only get about 6 or 7, and at other times none at all. End quote. Mr. Robert Guthrie, an old Kia hunter, thus describes his experience in connection with one camp, where the Kias were very troublesome. Quote, the camp was as usual high up. It was situated on a large plateau, where it was impossible to get near without disturbing the sheep and the Kias. I used to wait till well on in the night, and go, as quietly as possible, straight to the camp. The Kias, nine of them, were there the first night. I got two of them, and they came fairly regularly until I had got them all but one. This one was from the very first, in the habit of rising rather wild, and I got to know it well from an unusual call that it had. However, although I got eight out of the nine, the killing went on as badly as ever. Sometimes as many as three sheep would be killed in one night, but try as I would, I could not steal unawares upon the culprit, for he was always alert and became very sparing with his peculiar call. After many nights of weary walk and disappointment, I had a ten-mile tramp each time, 
five miles there and five miles back. It struck me that its call, after it had flown away, always came from the same direction. This was across a deep gorge, among some almost inaccessible rocks. The next day I went and carefully examined the rocks, and I could see in an open crevice about sixty feet above me a hole, which I was satisfied was the Kia's run. I came to the conclusion that this would be a likely place for him to spend the time after his night's carnival, and I determined, therefore, at first full moon to bring my gun and watch below for his homecoming. After a good many disappointments, I was sitting on a stone about three o'clock, one clear frosty morning in August, just beneath the crevices, and was just dropping off to sleep with my gun on my knees when a black shadow crossed the stones at my feet. I looked up and saw a kia, just alighting on the edge of the rock. I had it down in a twinkling. It was no doubt the old bird, for in my time on the station there were no more sheep killed in the camp. End quote. The last method generally employed is a very effective one, though sometimes risky, and consists in poisoning the dead carcasses of the sheep that have been killed by the kia. Strychnine is sometimes used alone, but more often this is mixed with arsenic, which is found to be very effective. A dead sheep, preferably one killed by the kia, is half-skinned and the poison is rubbed in, sometimes the kia wounds alone being treated. During the night, the birds come to feed on the remains of their earlier carousal, and usually by daylight a number of kias will be found lying on or around the dead body. One kia hunter says, quote, Another camp where the kias used to kill was very high up in a rough place, which was almost inaccessible at night. I shot what kias I could find about in the daytime, but never the right one, for the killing still continued. I half-skinned a sheep they had killed in the camp and put strychnine in it. When I came back in a few days' time, I found five dead kias. That ended the killing of the sheep in the camp. End quote. From North Otago, where the kias are still plentiful, comes the following account. Quote, we then baited three of the sheep carcasses with strychnine and sent a man out to camp on the spur. He picked up eight poisoned kias, two of which were actually on top of the carcass, as well as shooting twenty more of the birds. End quote. The poisoning has this advantage that, if it does not always poison the kias that kill the sheep, it at least kills those who gather round to share the spoil. But this method, though very effective, has its disadvantages, for the poisoned carcass may remain for months and be a continual menace to all sheepdogs passing that way. Shepherds are continually traveling up and down the country, accompanied by numerous sheepdogs, which, owing to their splendid training, are invaluable in the rough country. It is almost impossible to keep them always in sight, and, as they seem to be ever hungry, unless great care is taken, they get at the poisoned carcass. In this way a shepherd, in attempting to rid a station of kias, may lose more by the death of his dog than he has through the ravages of the birds all the winter. Therefore, poisoning has to be done with great care, and rather than leave the carcass to rot, it is often finally burnt, and the remains are buried. Even since suspicion fell on the kia, he has been legally branded as an outlaw. No game laws protect him. He knows not the peace of a close season. Regarded as having his beak against every man, every man's hand has been against him. Unfortunately, no full record has been kept of the numbers killed, but the following statistics will give some idea of the carnage. The Selwyn County Council has paid out, since 1887, 262 pounds, 9 shillings, 6 pence. The Ashburton County Council, since 1891, has paid out 24 pounds, 16 shillings, 6 pence, while the Amuri County Council received 531 heads in one season. Mr. Ralston, from a small run of his in Ashburton County, received 800 heads in one season, and the Lake County Council, up to 1884, had paid for 2,000 beaks. Another office received 1,574 heads, while since 1889, the Mackenzie County Council has paid out 193 pounds, 6 shillings, 6 pence, for 3,866 kias. The price paid per head by the different councils depends a good deal on the amount of damage done, though usually 2 shillings, 6 pence is the price. Today several men do not consider 10 shillings per head too high a price. Mr. E. B. Milton of Birdshill Station, Canterbury, in a letter to me on the payment for kias heads, says, quote, I have paid 10 shillings per head, 
since 1900, and in my experience the damage done to the sheep has not been serious since a substantial reward was instituted. The payment of a high price for heads is the best means of keeping shepherds and others engaged in the hill country, continually on the war path. Four of my neighbors now pay ten shillings each for heads. End quote. Up to 1906, the government paid six pence per head, but this has been raised to one shilling, and as the station owners usually pay one shilling six pence, the men receive altogether two shillings six pence per head. When the birds are shot, either the upper mandible is pulled off and kept in a matchbox until the station is reached, or else the head is screwed off, and when brought into the homestead, threaded on a string or wire. It is quite a common sight on the back stations to see a number of old decaying heads hanging on a nail in some little used shed. Here they usually remain until a stock inspector visits the place, or someone pays a visit to the nearest town. It naturally follows that the heads become so decayed that the offensive odor given out from them makes it almost impossible to count them out. One county clerk promised to send me down a large supply of heads for scientific purposes, but they smelt so bad that he knew the railway authorities would refuse to carry them, and so we buried the heads to get rid of them. End of chapter 12「by George Reginald Mariner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 13. Distribution. From the dark gorge where burns the morning star, I hear the glacier river rattling on and sweeping o'er his ice-plowed shingle bar, while wood owls shout in somber unison, and fluttering southern dancers glide and go, and black swans' airy trumpets wildly sweetly blow. Anne Glenny Wilson. The area of the Kia's distribution is continuous, but very limited. It is confined solely to the mountain country of the South Island of New Zealand, which extends for 400 miles in one direction and 80 miles in the other, making altogether an area of some 40,000 square miles. Wherever there is mountainous country in the South Island, with the exception of the Kaikoura Mountains in the northeast, the Kia can be found. It was first discovered by Mr. W. Mantell in 1856 in the Murihiku district, which embraces practically all Southland. It was Arrera Avis, and some thought that it was confined to Southland. However, as soon as men pierced the mountain fastnesses that run up the west coast of the island, its distribution was found to be much wider. A few years after its discovery, others were found not only in Southland and Otago, but in Canterbury, as far north as the Rangitata Gorge, about 200 miles north from where it was first seen. In 1859, Sir Julius van Haast saw it in the Mount Cook region, and a year later, Sir W. Buller found it in the Rangitata Gorge. As early as 1862, Sir James Hector noticed it in most of the snow mountains of Otago during his geological survey of that province, and in the same year, Sir Julius von Haast saw one on the Godley Glacier. In 1865, Sir Julius found it a long way above its supposed limit, around Brannings Pass, at the source of the Wilberforce River, and two years later he saw it still further north, near Arthur's Pass, on the West Coast Road. In 1868, Kias had become common around the lakes which lie on the borderline of Otago and Canterbury, and ten years later, they had increased all round the spot where they were first found, for Sir W. Buller speaks of them as being plentiful in Southland. In 1881, they were again seen at Arthur's Pass, for Dr. L. Cocaine, in a communication to me, states that his brother-in-law, Mr. A. Blakely, shot one there at that date. A year later, in 1882, Mr. W. Potts reported that he is known at Grasmere, on the West Coast Road, and in Lochinvar Station, North Canterbury, and at the headwaters of the Esk and Huranui, that is, about forty miles still further north of Arthur's Pass, their then supposed northernmost limit. In view of all these facts, it is surprising to find Sir W. Buller in 1883 quoting a letter from a Mr. Shrimpton to the effect that the Kia's area of distribution did not extend north of the Rakaia River. This is the more striking because both Dr. Host and Mr. Potts had already published records of Kias seen northward of that limit. 
The former found them at Arthur's Pass, 40 miles north of the Rakaia, in 1867, and the latter tells of their being seen at Huronui, another 40 miles north of Arthur's Pass. Later, in 1888, Mr. W. W. Smith, in a published article, says that he has had, during the previous three years, just reached the ranges above the Otira Gorge. However, like Sir W. Buller, he had evidently not seen the report of Dr. Host as to their being seen years before at Arthur's Pass, which is as far north as the Otira Gorge. It has been freely stated by writers on the Kia that, since its discovery in Southland, the bird has gradually migrated northward through the Otago and Canterbury provinces. This suggestion has not only been published, but has been almost universally adopted as true. This widespread acceptance is unfortunate, for on looking up all the available records, I find that the evidence does not support the statement. The evidence rather indicates that, whenever and wherever men have penetrated the mountainous country of the three lower provinces of the South Island, keys have been found in the parts explored. It was because the Otago and Southland Mountains were explored first, and the Canterbury Mountains a little later, that the idea of the northern migration was suggested, and very likely, if Dr. Host and Sir James Hector had explored the Canterbury Alpine region first, the alleged migration might have had its direction reversed. Even if we take the dates and places of the Kia's discovery, the facts do not uphold the theory. In 1856, Mr. W. Mantell found the Kia in Southland. The exact spot is not recorded. Then, instead of finding it a few miles further north in Otago, Dr. Haast discovered it three years later at Mount Cook in Canterbury, about 200 miles further north, thus missing the large Otago province which lies between. It was not till three years later that Sir James Hector reported it to be among the snow mountains of the intervening province. In the same year, Dr. Haast saw it at Browning's Pass, about 80 miles still further north, and in 1867 it was known at the Lochinvar Station, 60 miles further north again of Browning's Pass. We have no record of the Kia being found further north than the Lochinvar Station until 1882. This is very likely due to the fact that no scientific man explored the country. If one did, he left no available records. It will thus be seen that, instead of the Kia's area of distribution being increased a few miles further north year by year, as would have been the case had the birds traveled north, the birds were found at different places, sometimes 200 miles north of their previous location, while they were not found in the intervening country until many years afterwards. It is also very unlikely that, the moment the birds were discovered, they made a rush northward, so that in 11 years they had migrated 300 miles from their old homes. There are two pieces of evidence entirely against this unlikely procedure. First, if the Kias had migrated, then they should have become rare in Otago and Southland. But in fact, they were not very plentiful in the South until after 1868, and by this time the Kia was recorded at Lochinvar, some 300 miles further north. Second, the reason given for the Kia's migration is that the systematic slaughter in the early days drove them north. But the whole idea falls to the ground when we remember that, in 1867, a year before the bird was even suspected of sheep killing, and so a year before the slaughter of the bird began, the Kia was recorded from the Lochinvar district, that is, the very country into which it was alleged to have been driven by the aforesaid systematic slaughter. There is, however, a lot of sound evidence to show that the Kia's area of distribution is widening. This widening is due, as far as I can ascertain, to the great increase in their numbers. For, though their numbers have been thinned by forty years of continuous slaughter, they are still numerous in many parts. It was noticed that, soon after the birds began to kill sheep and eat them, their numbers increased, so that where they had been seen in tens, they could be seen in fifties. Many sheep owners put this down to the plentiful supply of food obtained from the dead animals. This would appear at first sight to show that all Kias killed sheep, but I have already, I hope, made clear that only a comparative few do the killing, though the rest may join in the feast. 
This increase has naturally caused the Kia's area of distribution to expand, and now, instead of confining themselves to main ranges, they come down even as far as the foothills on the east and the sea coast on the west. The latter limit is supported by the fact that they have been seen at Koitarangi near Hokitika and at Mahitahi near Bruce Bay, while in June of 1906 Captain Bollins of the government steamer Henemoa told me that he saw one flying along the beach at Bruce Bay itself. To the east they have come down to the edge of the plains, and south almost to the coastline. The only direction in which the birds can now extend is north into Nelson and Marlborough, and though the Kia's northernmost limit remained at the headwaters of the Esk and Huronui rivers for about forty years after their discovery, there has been, during the last few years, a spreading into these two northern provinces. The stations around Hanmer have been troubled with Kias for some years, and in 1903 Mr. Edward Kidson, while climbing Mount Robert near Lake Rotoiti Nelson, saw one at close quarters. This spot is about 40 miles southwest of Nelson City and 40 miles north of Hanmer. Mr. H. M. Bryant, who was accompanying Mr. Kidson at the time, and has done a lot of mountaineering in the Nelson province, states that he had never before seen one in that district. While the late owner of the station at Mount Robert told him that it was the first time that Ikea had been seen on his run, through the kindness of Mr. G. R. Kidson, I am able to record two other instances in the Nelson province. In 1904, Ikea was caught by Mr. A. G. Hammond at Appleby, only 13 miles southwest of Nelson City, and in the same year, Mr. T. S. Rowling caught one at Rewaka, a few miles north of Motueka, about 50 miles northwest of Nelson, and 95 miles north of Hanmer. This is at present the northernmost limit of the Kia's area of distribution, which may be defined on the north as reaching the shores of Cook Strait. Through the aid of Mr. T. E. Curry, I can now publish reports of the Kia's presence in the Marlborough province, where before it was practically unknown, showing that in addition to traveling up northwest through Nelson, they are also traveling up northeast through Marlborough. In January 1906, one was found at the head of the Waihopai River, at a place known as the Glazebrook Fare. Again in May 1906, one was seen on the Tarndale Station, about halfway up the Saxton River, some miles north of the homestead. Another correspondent reports that he has seen one thirty miles only from Blenheim, the capital of the province. Now that Kias have reached the north coast of the South Island, one wonders if the Cook Strait will prove a sufficient barrier to prevent them from flying over to the North Island and spreading there. The two islands are only fifteen miles apart at their nearest points, and on a clear day the opposite coast can easily be seen. This northern extension of recent years does not, I consider, in any way support the old idea that the birds migrated northward for a decade or so after their discovery. They were known at the Lochinvar Station about 1866-7, to seven, and since then they have practically not made any further advance until 1900, but at the present time they are certainly spreading northward. The migration may be due to the increased numbers, or perhaps to the incessant slaughter, which has been going on for some years. What really started the northern migration theory was knowledge of the fact that, though the Kias themselves never migrated northward in the early days, yet the habit of sheep killing has extended from Otago northward to Nelson. No one thought of recording the Kia's presence, as long as they did no harm, but as soon as they began to harass the flocks, reports were sent to the daily papers. As the habit gradually spread northward, many jumped to the conclusion that the birds had just arrived, whereas in many instances we know that the birds were on some of the stations years before they commenced to kill. For instance, at Browning's Pass, the Kias had been seen in 1865, but no cases of sheep killing were known until 1886. The first instance recorded of sheep killing was in 1868, in the south near Lake Wanaka, and thence the killing is spread south to Lake Wakatipu and north to the Amiri district, including Hanmer. About 1880, the birds' depredations were recorded at the lakes south of Canterbury, and by 1886, after passing north through the Peel Forest and the Ashburton Gorge, the Kia had commenced to kill sheep around Mount Torless, 
Since then, it has slowly extended north to the stations in the Amiri district, and so badly affected were they that in 1906 a meeting of rent-holders was held in Coveden to try to abate the nuisance. So far, I have no records of sheep killing in Marlborough and North Nelson, though the Kias are now found there. In Westland also, the Kias have spread, for in 1906 Mr. Condon of Bruce Bay, South Westland, for the first time, had some sheep killed by Kias. The fact that no fossils of Kias have been found in the North Island of New Zealand seems to indicate that the birds never extended further than the South Island. But while in the Museum Christchurch, I unexpectedly came across two wing bones and a lower mandible of a kia obtained from the Chatham Islands. These interesting specimens were presented to the museum by Mr. J. J. Fougere of Tione on the main island and were identified by the late Captain F. W. Hutton. These, with some more kia's bones and other subfossils, were found in some drifting sand hills at Petra Bay by Mr. Fougere in 1897. In a letter he states, quote, I do not think the Kia or Kaka were ever numerous in the Chatham Islands, as the remains are rare in comparison with the other fossil avifauna. End quote. From the number of fossils already discovered, there seems to have been a much larger avifauna on the islands than at present. This is supported by a pamphlet written by Dr. Arthur Dendy, then professor of biology, Canterbury College, who visited these islands in 1901. He says, quote, All who have studied the question are agreed that the fauna and flora of the Chatham Islands are simply isolated detachments of those of New Zealand, although the striking differences which we have had occasion to notice imply a long period of isolation. This view of the case requires us to believe that the islands, though now separated by 400 miles of open ocean, were at one time either actually connected with the New Zealand mainland or, at any rate, much more nearly so than at the present day. A belief which is strongly supported by the fact that the sea between New Zealand and the Chathams is comparatively shallow, only from 500 to 1,000 metres in depth, while further to the east it sinks at once 4,500 meters. In the upper Pleistocene period, it is probable that the area of New Zealand was greatly extended so as to embrace, for example, Chatham Islands in the east, Lord Howe Island in the northwest, Campbell and Auckland Islands in the south. This condition is supposed to have lasted on into the Pleistocene times and to have been followed by another depression, which left the islands very much in their present condition. The former land connection thus roughly sketched out, together with the ocean current already referred to, would be quite sufficient to account for the great resemblance between the fauna and flora of the Chatham Islands and those of New Zealand. End quote. The geology of the islands seems to indicate that they once formed part of the large area, as is shown by the presence of schists and similar rocks, while the finding of limestone seems to point to a depression at a later period. The land thus seems to have been elevated and again depressed, leaving it very much in its present condition. This closer connection between the two groups of islands may explain the presence of Kia fossils on the Chathams. This theory, however, only adds mystery to the strange fact that no Kias or Kia fossils have ever been found in the North Island, situated only 15 miles away. As early as 1888, Sir W. Buller says that he is certain that these interesting birds would soon be extinct. But in spite of the thousands that have been killed, they are still common in the mountainous country of the South Island. No doubt the almost inaccessible position of their nests and the rough nature of the country in which they live are responsible for their preservation. When harassed, they often retreat to the most inaccessible fastnesses of the Alps. Here they are practically safe, for this exceedingly rough country can never be of much use, except for scenic purposes. It is therefore doubtful if the Kia will become extinct for many years to come. If, however, closer settlement of the land, accompanied by the destruction of the forest and the systematic slaughter now going on, should threaten to exterminate the Kias, I would suggest that, in order to prevent these interesting birds from becoming absolutely lost to the scientific world, a number of them should be placed on one of the outlying islands, 
where they could live and flourish without doing injury to any one. The most suitable islands, as far as I can ascertain, are the Aucklands, which lie 190 miles south by west from the most southerly point of Stewart Island. There would be very little chance of the birds returning to the mainland, and though the hills rise to a height of about 2,000 feet only, there seems to be enough forest and high country to make a very satisfactory reserve for these interesting parrots. Attacking Other Animals Though the sheep are favorite objects of the Kia's attack, it does not seem to confine itself to them, for several instances are reported where dogs, horses, and rabbits have been mauled. I do not consider that these attacks are really made to procure food, but rather for fun and mischief. One correspondent gives the following account of an attack upon a horse. Quote, the pack horse was tethered on a piece of flat ground, about ten chains from the camp. After we had tea, I strolled over to where there was a large flock of kias on a little knoll above the pack horse. This would be about an hour before dusk. One or two flew down onto the horse's back. He was an old, stiff-built cobby horse of very sluggish nature. He took no notice of the kias when they flew off and on his back for some time, giving him an occasional peck. At last an old fellow perched on his back and started operations in a most serious manner. He soon had the old horse showing more life than he had ever done before. In fact, before he got the Kia dislodged, he was almost mad. When I got down to him, he was in a heavy sweat, and the blood was trickling slightly over his loins. On examination, I found a nasty wound that took a long time to heal, as it became very dirty. Ever after, the horse would go almost frantic when there were any Kias about. End quote. Shepherds report that rabbits are sometimes killed by them, while dogs are often worried by their attentions. The birds are sometimes found eating the carcasses of deer. One case is known where a human body was torn about by them. On the minaret station, a musterer was sent out to attend to some sheep on high country. The station is famous for its rugged and dangerous peaks, and is said to contain some of the wildest country on a sheep run. At night, the man failed to report himself and a search party was sent out to seek him. They found his body lying in a gully, where he had evidently fallen from the heights above. It was attended by two or three kias, who had torn holes in his clothes, and already torn the flesh about. This is, I think, the only instance known where the kias attacked a human body. From the position of the body, it is almost certain that the man was dead a long time before the birds began to maul him. End of chapter 13 End of the Kia, A New Zealand Problem, by George Reginald Mariner.